Pretty on the nose, so we'll call ourselves to order. Roll call, please. Oh, I'm sorry. I've got ahead. Like, if you'd stand with me for the Pledge of Allegiance. All right, now we'll call the roll. Eva Henry, Steve Odoricio, Jeff Baker, Elise Jones, David Beacom, Randy Wheelock, Chrissy Fanganello, Anthony Graves, Robin Kniech, Roger Partridge, Ron Angles, Libby Zabo. In the house. Ooh. Bob Viper here. Bob Roth here. Larry Vidum here. David Spellman, Aaron Brockett, here. Ann Justin, here. Lynn Baca, here. Tara Redlaw, here. George Teal, Jason Bauer, Tammy Maurer, here. Catherine Hyder, Laura Christman, here. Richard Champion, here. Rick Teeter, here. Debbie Nasta, Catherine Whitman. Steve Conklin, here. Linda Olson, Jeff Deacon, Mark Gruber, Daniel Dick, present. Lisa Jones, Laura Brown, Lynette Kelsey, here. Scott Norquist, Storm Glore, Jim Dale, here. Ron Rakowski, present. Mike Hillman, Stephanie Walton, hello. Danny Gutwein, here. Jerry Bean, Karina Elrod, here. Jacob Lofgren, here. Wynn Shaw, here. John Peck, here. Ashley Stolzman, here. Connie Sullivan, here. Colleen Whitlow, Joyce Palazuski, Deborah Jerome, Sean Forey, Chris Larson, Jordan Sowers, Joyce Downing, here. John Dyack, here. Sally Dago, here. Rita Dozal, here. Jessica Sandgren, Herb Atchison, Here. Bud Starker, Here. Adam Zarin, Deborah Perkins Smith, Present. Bill Van Meter. Here. And we do have a phone. I believe we have a quorum. It's a pretty full yeah. house tonight. I think so. So the next item on the agenda is agenda item four. Uh, entertain a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Have a motion and a second. Discussion. Seeing none, all those in favor, aye. Opposed, nay. Thank you. Strategic informational briefing, briefings item five. So I want to introduce uh, the new CDOT executive director. Um, I have three pages of, bi no I don't, I don't have three pages. Um, Michael P. Lewis has recently been appointed as the executive director for the Colorado Department of Transportation, where he is charged with leading the department in planning for and addressing Colorado's transportation needs. Mr. Lewis oversees 3,300 employees statewide and an annual budget of approximately 1.4 billion, guiding an organization, organization committed to becoming the best DOT in the country for its customers. Prior to this role, he served as CDOT's uh, Deputy Executive Director, Chief Operating Officer since May of 2015. Before coming to Colorado, he was the Director of Rhode Island's DOT and a board member of the Rhode Island Public Transit Authority, Rhode Island Turnpike and Bridge Authority, and the Rhode Island Public Rail Corporation from March 2008 to February 2015. Prior to his appointments in Rhode Island, he served as the director of Boston's Central Artery Tunnel Project, also known as the Big Dig, from April 2000 until project completion in 27. Mike is a past president of the American Association of State Highways and transportation officials, and is a member of the National Academy of Construction. So with that, I would like to uh, welcome um, Mike Lewis and ask him to say a few words. Thanks. The most important thing on that is that I'm not Shale and Bat. Um, um, although I did work very closely with Shale, and obviously here as his deputy executive, executive director, and 
back in the east um, when Shailen was the Secretary of Transportation in Delaware. Um, I was the director in Rhode Island, so that's how we got to know each other. Um, and I'm very pleased to be here. Adam, governor's office is late. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm very pleased to be here with, with, with all of you. And I'm not going to take a lot of time. I, I'm more interested in what questions you have of me. But I, let me give you a little bit of background. I've, had, I've been in this business, as many of you have, for more than three decades. Um, had some experience um, at the state level. I started my career back in 1984 in a western district of Massachusetts as a recently graduated civil engineer. Um, worked with a local community in, in Berkshire County, if any of you know Lenox, Mass. Um, and then um, was asked to come down to Boston for a little project down there. And uh, worked on the Big Dig for 16 years. The last seven years as the director of the project um, until its completion in 2007, and then I went on and became the director of the Rhode Island DOT until coming out here. Um, I've worked for nine different governors, three failed presidential candidates. Don't tell the Governor Hickenlooper that. Um, and, uh, and, and whatever success I've had, um, which is debatable, um, it's been through working with people. It's been through collaboration. Um, it's been through um, trying to understand where other people are coming from and and there and we all in this business have different opinions we have different needs um, different perspectives and I think we're better off when we can try to understand where each other are coming from and try to find common ground and get to a positive result and I think we in the industry transportation industry have have um, a century of history of doing that not without some tribulations but I think that we are committed to moving things forward. We, I think we believe, I believe certainly, that transportation exists for two reasons. It's to support the economic vitality of whatever jurisdiction you're in, whether it's a village, a town, a county, a state, or the country. And the second reason is to support the quality of life of the people that live there. So everything that in, in my head is about what can transportation do to support the economic vision of the region and what can we do to support the quality of life of the people who live here? We can have a positive effect on quality of life, and through our actions and inactions, we can have a negative effect on quality of life. And I think we're experiencing that now here in Colorado. And I think it's from coming from spending seven years in a state with a shrinking economy um, and no room, literally, no room to do anything new or innovative, um, to come here to what is quite literally wide open space, as all of you know, but also a growing economy with opportunity. And we have opportunity to do things well and learn from others' pasts, and we have an opportunity not to make mistakes. And I think you know, the reason you are all here is because you don't want to do that. You're looking out for how do, you, how do we grow this region and how does transportation affect the growth of this region in a way that is thoughtful, um, is respectful, um, and has a vision for the future. And so I pledged to work closely with Doug, to work closely with the city and all of you, many of the faces in the room I've, I've had the pleasure of working with, to work with RTD closely, to work with E470, because we're all in the same business. We're all trying to improve transportation, and we're going to do it if we work together um, and have a little give and take, um, because it's going to take that. Um, but um, I, I also think that there are times when, in all of our lives and in our initiatives, that you just see the planet starting to align. And if you see the planet starting to align, what can we do to encourage that alignment? If First, we have to see it. Then how do we encourage it? And how do we then take advantage of it when it happens? Be ready to take advantage of it. I think that um, we're, in a, we're in a mode there. I think, you know, the the the... the what has been discussed last year in the legislature and made, had some successes but not a complete success. What is being discussed at the very first day of this legislative session is a very positive step forward that are those, those planets may be coming into alignment. I'm not so naive to say it just happens, but I think there's an opportunity and I think that we collectively, and we all have a role in this, um, can help nudge those planets into alignment. So I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, you know, this is the end of the Hickenlooper administration. Um, and I am here. 
I'm committed to this administration. I'm committed to CDOT for the next, however, 364 days or whatever it is. I, I committed to Shalin. I committed to the governor. I will be here to turn out the lights on the Hickenlooper administration, and I will work every day to do, uh, have a positive effect on moving transportation forward in Colorado and to turn over the reins to the next administration with a clear plan, a clear mission, a clear vision of how we can improve transportation in the state. So I'm committed to all of you, the same, the same thing. Um, but I know CDOT can't do it alone, and that's a good thing, right? Um, so I, we want to hear from you. Uh, we want to work with you, and that's what I'm here for. With that, Bob, I'd be glad to take any questions, as long as they don't come from Deb. <laughs> She might ask the tough ones. Questions or comments from the board? Well, obviously, I'm sure I echo everybody on the board welcoming you to Colorado, and I'm sure you'll have success. And anything we can do to support you, please don't hesitate. Great. Thank you. Thank you all. OK, agenda item six is report of the chair. Have a few things. Um, First of all, we have a number of new members and alternates. If I uh, mention your name, if you'd just please raise your hand or stand or whatever to be recognized. The first one is the new member for Centennial, Tommy Maurer. We have a new member for Inglewood, Linda Olson. Linda's not here, I take it. The new member who was formerly the alternate for Lafayette, uh, Stephanie Walton. Hello. And the new alternate for Lafayette is Christine Berg. I don't see Christine. Um, the new member for Gilpin County is Ron Ingalls. All right. New member from Golden is Jim Dale. And we also have a new alternate for Golden, Paul Hassman. Uh, temporary alternate for North Glen, Joyce Downing. <laughs> Joyce is no stranger to this body, so been around a number of years. Um, new alternate for Greenwood Village is George Lance. Back in the back. <laughs> and we have a new alternate for Sheridan, Roberta Mooney. Did I miss anybody that's a new member or a new alternate? I'm sorry. Marsha Martin from Longmont, thank you. Oh, okay, thank you, Laura. Okay. Anybody else? All right, well, thank you all for being here. Uh, obviously, for a number of reasons, this board, because of its size and because of a number of other factors, there's quite often a lot of turnover. And uh, embrace one of the one or two of the new members and help them along. There's, as you all know, there's a lot to learn with the Dr. Cog board. And uh, please help help out the new members understand the ins and outs and acronyms and all that good stuff. Uh, the next thing is the report on Regional Transportation Committee. And um, there really isn't a report. We met yesterday morning, but all three of the items that we talked about, two of them are on the action agenda, agenda item 10 and 11, and one of them is on the informational item, agenda item 17. So all the items that we talked about yesterday morning at RTC will be discussed at the board tonight. The next item that I have is I wanted to uh, talk about somebody's last meeting tonight. So this is Director Kanich's last meeting with us, and I wanted to give her an opportunity to say a couple of words, if you would like. Well. Yeah, well, yeah. Okay, well, well th thank you very much. <laughs> no, go ahead. <laughs> give her a mic. <laughs> that was tricky to ask you to say something and not give you a mic. <laughs> Thanks. I, um, I, I, I got to say a few words at our, our performance and engagement committee, and it's been, um, it's been seven years that I've been a pretty active alternate on many, many committees and board member, and so I've really enjoyed serving with all of you. 
Um, and, uh, I, you know, it's a really interesting time to govern in the region, and so um, it's, it's no easy feat. So thanks for, for what you all put in. I, um, I'm really proud of the way the organization has evolved. I think we, um, through some really collaborative work, for those of you who are new, the governance structure that we use in the body is newer, newish, and I think it's really effective. I think the committees are doing great work. The executive committee is more formal and, and doing good leadership. So I'm, I think there's a good legacy here. And, and um, I guess uh, I've, I've thoroughly um, trained my uh, new board member who will be, he's current alternate, Kevin Flynn, and, um, and then the new alternate will be Jolene Clark. He's from South Central Denver. And so I'm sure um, I thoroughly scared them. So <laughs> if they don't show up, I hope someone calls to check on them. <laughs> but, um, but they're going to do a great job. And so please, please welcome them as much as you've welcomed me and, and try to get to know them. And um, you know, we're lucky we're one of the only jurisdictions that gets to do it a team and so um, please you know in our transition feel free to reach out to Anthony and, and Chrissy and um, and I hope I get to see folks around so please say hi and stay in touch thank you thank you thank you Robin um, just real quick Robin has been one of the very uh, influential voices on this board uh, as you can see it's a it's a very large and sometimes cumbersome board but Robin has always had really good insight and um, has, has never been, she's never shirked the responsibility of giving input and having thoughtful dialogue on whatever topic it is. So thank you, Robin. Um, the next item is report of the Performance and Engagement Committee. Thank you, Mr. Director Chair. Pfeiffer. Thank you. Um, just two items. One item, speaking of new folks, uh, we did review a mentorship uh, program that will be coming out, and I hope uh, we can find some volunteers to help the transition of new members uh, into uh, this board, which uh, could be overwhelming at times because we were all new at one point or another. And then the second item we talked about, and I hope to see a lot of participation. I won't be the chair of the Performance Engagement Committee by that time because John Dyack will be. But we will be coming up on Doug's uh, nine-month-ish review in May is what we're hoping. So we'll be putting out a survey for you all to fill out and bring back. Uh, please, 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 I can't stress enough, we would like to have 100% participation in that so we can give some fair and, and, and clear feedback uh, back to Doug. I think he's had a long interview and then he's had a very long nine months already with us. So um, it would be nice to, to have a full participation in that. That's all I have. Thank you. Questions of the committee chair? The next item is report on finance and budget. Director Dyack. Thank you, chair. Uh, we had a couple items, uh, consent agenda. We had a couple uh, authorizations, contracts. Um, it's One was the guaranteed ride home service fee program. Uh, the second one was the uh, van pool services uh, with RTD. Uh, and then we had a couple, it was an, I, an, an IT theme on the action agenda. Uh, we had a three-year contract for the server backup, and we, uh, we purchased some software licenses for uh, the VTCLI. And uh, in Dr. Cog speak, uh, that could be a trivia question, but uh, I will let you off the hook. It is the Veterans Transportation and Community Living Initiative. So we, uh, we end up with that, and then we had some uh, good discussion. Uh, Jayla Sanchez-Warren and Jenny Dock uh, gave us an update on the uh, service provider contracts with the, uh, the issues uh, going on in Washington. Uh, we're creating a 10% reduction on contracts. Uh, this is going to be a temporary measure, but it looks like we're fully funded for the end of the year. Um, and um, we're just crossing our fingers. So uh, with that being said, I'll turn it back to the chair. Thank you very much. Questions of the committee chair? Okay. Seeing none, the next item we have is uh, we have some people who are being presented their five-year service award. If I could have Commissioner Henry come up. I thought I saw her here. She is here. Ah, she was hiding. So it says honoring five years of service to the board of the directors of Dr. Cog. And they give you applause. <laughs> <laughs> it's away.
next is Commissioner Elise Jones. And ironically, her says the same thing. This is happening only because Bob hasn't figured out how to award things to himself. <laughs> <laughs> but this, this is, uh, as we have with uh, Elise and Eva tonight, five years of service is a long time to be serving on this board. And not only has Bob and I have worked together through his entire rotation through the board officers, he'll be staying on after this as the past chair, but we want to thank Bob and all the rest of them for the dedicated service they provided to Dr. Cog. Bob, congratulations. <laughs> So if you want to have something to carry it home in, don't forget your boxes up here. <laughs> All right. Next is agenda item seven, and that is report of the executive director. Mr. Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A uh, number of items this evening. The first I would like to mention is something that uh, Director Pfeiffer mentioned in his P&E report is the mentorship program. Uh, the Forms and Engagement Committee did approve a mentorship program. Uh, and uh, for the new members out there, we know it's like drinking through a water hose. Uh, water hose? Fire hose. Fire hose. Fire hose. Some sort of hose. No, that's what didn't sound right. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, either way, you're drowning, right? So, um, uh, so, we, so we will be sending out an email here shortly within the next week or so for those that are interested in being a mentor e. And, uh, and also, we're also going to send out an email to our regular board members for those that are willing to participate in the mentorship program as well. They're willing to take someone under their wing and just show them, show them the way. Um, it's, it's kind of a three-month long process. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, we've, we set some structure to it. But really, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's what you guys want it to be. So we, uh, we strongly encourage those new board members to get involved in that and, and alternates as well. Um, let me see. Uh, the annual award celebration, I know I've been mentioning this for several months now and I will continue until that date. Um, the annual celebration is, uh, is, you know, is our celebration of the best in regionalism. It's going to be held on April 27th at the Higher Regency, just down, down the street here at 15th in California. What did I say? 27th. April 25th at the Higher Regency. Um, so we are currently uh, looking for nominations for our various awards. The deadline Four nominations is uh, scheduled for January 31st, which is two weeks from today. Um, the, the two awards specifically are the MetroVision Awards, which rec recognize outstanding projects, programs, and plans that further our aspirational vision for this region, and the John B. Christensen Award, which is our most pre prestigious award and recognizes one individual who has contributed to, uh, to collaboration that makes our region as great as it is. Um, last year's winner for those that attended was Tom Clark. Uh, who's recently retired from Metro Denver Economic Development Corporation. So please, if you have any thoughts, uh, even if you just want to call me, if you want to just throw out a few names you're not quite sure, or a couple projects, please just give me a shout and we, we can talk through it. Um, you have a number of things at your desk today with regards to uh, various events upcoming. The first is Winter Bike to Work Day. Uh, Dr. Cog's uh, Way to Go team has been working with CDOT and stakeholders throughout the entire state of Colorado um, in the first ever statewide uh, winter bike to work day. Um, there's this kind of dashboard that's, that's, uh, that's, it's a worldwide dashboard. So you sign up and th so uh, each city is represented. So, you know, if we sign up, so, so we're competing against other cities and countries around the world. Well, there was a town in Serbia that was actually leading the registration, the registrants uh, as of this morning, but we caught them overnight. Yeah. <laughs> so while, while they sleep, while Serbia sleeps, we pounced, and we're up by one vote. 
So, followed by, I think it's like four Canadian cities, right? I just hope the, uh, the cities that are around, around the equator and that don't, don't, uh, don't figure this out. And... <laughs> but anyway, so it, it's, a, it's a great event. We're, we're, real, we're real excited about it. And I don't know how excited I am about my commute from Castle Pines up to here in, in, on uh, February 9th, but I'm going to do it. Uh, board orientation se session. This is primarily for new members as well as your staff um, that might be interested to learn just a little bit more about Dr. Cog. We currently have one scheduled for Thursday, February 15th at 4 p.m. here in this room. Um, and we do strongly encourage you to attend that. It will be myself as well as senior staff will lead you through um, you know, presentation about just kind of Dr. Cog 101. So please, please uh, uh, participate in that event. And just, just contact Connie to get you on so we have a, a head count of who's coming. Um, we also have a request for data for you guys. We are, we, uh, every year, um, I think we sent out an email here in the last day or so with regards to this. Every year we reach out to your communities, uh, your data professionals in your communities to begin to uh, ask for, for data that you might have that might be of interest to us and in fulfilling and completing our, our regional uh, data catalog. Um, so I just want to give you a heads up that's coming. Um, we encourage your community's data team to provide this information to us by February 28th. So we'll be, we'll be reaching out to you all here uh, real soon on that. I, I wanted to provide you just a little bit of information on a program that staff here has been involved with through the years. I mean, I think it's 15 plus years we've been doing this. There's, um, there's a, uh, a nursing home called Sparely Center. Uh, it, we, we've been working with over, during the, the, over the Christmas holidays for, for years now. Um, in this past year, we, we a staff purchased over uh, Christmas gifts for 125 residents of Sparely. Um, it is, it is, you know, Sparely Center. In case you guys don't know, it's it's some of the poorest, uh, you know, poorest uh, residents uh, in, in in the Denver metro area, and the visitors are far and in between. So we really uh, we really look forward to this every year. Um, the coordinator at Sparely Center, they uh, they said everybody loved and were thrilled thrilled with their gifts, and we always. Uh, uh, our staff always does an amazing job with that. So I just wanted to recognize the good work that we do on that side. Last but not least, I wanted to make sure everybody was aware of uh, uh, the possibility of a transportation ballot initiative. Um, and I think many of you know this at various levels, but uh, the Denver Metro Chamber of Commerce and the Colorado Contractors Association, um, they've convened a group of, of stakeholders um, to discuss the possible statewide transportation ballot. Uh, this coming November. Uh, Dr. Cog is participating in those meetings. I want you uh, to know that, if nothing else. Um, and the most recent meeting was held this past Thursday over at Denver Metro Chamber, um, where they provided some polling results on the, the you know, various funding scenarios with regards to what might be asked in that ballot initiative. I will say, if nothing else, just to wrap it up, that um, the polling looks better now than what it has in the past, over the past few years. And Lord knows we've done a lot of polling with, the, with these groups. And um, so uh, I think we just need to continue to educate the public on the, uh, the, dr the drastic need for, for transportation funding within our region. Um, you know, the, the template that the, uh, that the, uh, the chamber is, is kind of using in this group is really grabbed onto is kind of the same template that was used for 1242, for House Bill 1242. So it's basically, um, you know, the split would be uh, of the 100 percent. So there's 45 percent that would go to directly to CDOT. There's 15 percent, which is dedicated to multimodal transportation, uh, 20 percent to the cities, 20 percent to the county statewide. So that's kind of the, the framework we're working with right now. Um, and of course, you know, we provided you guys a list of, of uh, you know, a preliminary list that CDOT has developed. We sent that out to you late, late last week. Um, and, uh, and you know, so, and, and I know several of you provide a comment to ourselves in CDOT. Um, so, so really, as far as unanswered questions that we're really looking at now is, uh, you know, what will be the source of that, of that uh, sales, of that tax initiative? Will it be sales tax, which seems to be probably the most prominent right now in, this, in discussions, as well as the SOC, SOT or uh, specific ownership tax? Those are the two that have really seemed to rise to the top. And, um, and of course, once that determined, what is the appropriate funding amount? Is that, you know, half a percent, one percent of a sales tax or whatever? So th those discussions are being had right now. Um, and uh, so I just want to let you know that. But it is, 
there is some urgency to this. Um, I know they need to have ballot titles uh, drafted by uh, by the between, uh, kind of towards the end of this month. And um, so we can have more discussion about this during our legislative item if that, that's a desire of the group. But I just wanted to share that with you to make sure you understand that uh, Dr. Cog's staff is involved in those discussions and are looking out for our best interests. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'm done. Oh, I got one more thing. Please. Because I, I don't think you mentioned it in your report. I thought you were going to steal my thunder. I, I wanted to let everybody know, um, for those that are new, this will be new. But for those who have been around for a while, uh, we have been in negotiations for quite some time now on, uh, on moving locations. Um, and I, I uh, actually signed our lease contract with 1001 17th Street uh, this past Friday. So we're very excited about it. Um, so it looks like our moving date will be somewhere between uh, May 1st and June 1st, kind of during, sometime during the month of May. So stay tuned to that. Um, and, uh, yeah, I just wanted to share that information with you. Awesome. Questions or comments of the executive director? Thank you very much. Yes, sir. A lot of information. Um, next on the agenda is agenda item eight, which is public comment. Up to 45 minutes is allocated for public comment. If anybody would like to address the board, you would have three minutes opportunity to do that. I would ask you to come to the podium, identify yourself, and then you get three minutes. If more than 45 minutes is necessary, we will have that after the meeting is over. And we do ask that there be no public comment for which there's been a prior public hearing. Is there anybody that would like to address the board this evening? Seeing nobody, we will move on to agenda item nine, which is approval of the consent agenda, the meetings of December 20th, and the designated location for posting notices of meetings. If have a motion and a second discussion. All those in favor, aye. aye. Opposed, nay. Thank you very much. <clears throat> agenda item 10 under our action agenda, discussion of federal safety targets. Mr. Rieger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good evening, everyone. Jacob Rieger, Transportation Planning Manager at Dr. Cog. Um, so this item concerns a federal requirement that we have um, as Dr. Cog is the MPO for the region, the Metropolitan Planning Organization. Um, some of you have seen pieces of this before, but given our new board members, want to give you just a little bit of beef, brief background on this. <clears throat> um, so the topic of safety is obviously one of the most important, if not the most important things that we all collectively and individually work on. Um, you know, we always say safety is, is job one. It's job one here at Dr. Cog in many ways, and it is in your own communities. So as we talk about this federal requirement tonight, I think it's just worth sort of reminding that, you know, we all are working on this issue of safety, and we all are doing many things, you know, together here at Dr. Cog and in your own, uh, in your own cities and, and counties and municipalities um, and, and our own agencies that are at the table tonight. Here I've listed just a few of the things that uh, here at Dr. Cog that we're doing. I won't go through these individually, but just to say that, you know, although this is a new federal requirement, the topic of safety and work on safety is definitely not new. Um, this particular requirement uh, that we'll be talking about tonight comes from the federal transportation legislation, which is known as the FAST Act. Um, so really the point here, um, and I'm not going to go through this sort of circle of things, just the idea that this isn't just us here at Dr. Cog or here in Colorado. This is a national thing where every MPO uh, around the country, every metropolitan planning organization, every state DOT is going through this similar process of setting, in this case, safety targets, which is what we'll be uh, talking about tonight. And this sort of gets rolled up from kind of that ground level, rolled up to kind of a national story uh, about what's going on with safety, as you see on their national goals. Uh, and so on. So as part of the FAST Act, um, <clears throat> where this requirement falls, it's under performance-based planning is what it's called. And again, you know, this is something that's not new to us here at Dr. Cog. It's not new to many of you. Um, but with the FAST Act and with MAP 21 before it, um, codified very specific things that we need to do. Um, you see those on the screen here. Tonight we're just going to talk about safety, but we will be coming back to you in the coming months on some of these other topics. So specifically on safety and the requirements of the FAST Act, we are required to measure and set targets for five um, aspects of safety that you see listed on the screen here. Um, so tonight I'm going to share with you kind of just briefly how we got to uh, setting the proposed targets that we're going to ask you to approve tonight on these five measures for safety. 
Just a little bit of process on that. I said that this is a requirement of both us at, at Dr. Cog as the MPO, the Metropolitan Planning Organization for the Denver region, as well as uh, CDOT as the state DOT. CDOT had a requirement to set uh, their 2018 targets uh, last summer. They set them last August. We have a requirement to set our 2018 targets uh, by the end of February of this year. So we are setting targets for the year 2018. They're called 2018 targets, but they actually cover a five-year uh, kind of average of 2014 through 2018. This is something that we'll be doing annually, so you will see me again in probably just about a year to come to you with the 2019 targets, which will cover the period 2015 to 2019. So each year we'll do this again and we'll move up a year, but they will each cover a five-year kind of rolling average. We'll report that to CDOT, and then CDOT will report our targets to the Federal Highway Administration. The area in which these targets will apply that we're setting tonight is the area in red, which is our MPO area, kind of our urbanized uh, planning area, our transportation management area. The areas in green, which are the more rural areas of our Dr. Cog area, as well as other areas around the state that are outside of MPO boundaries, uh, are covered by CDOT and their work on setting safety targets. So tonight we're focusing on the red, uh, which is our urban counties within the Denver metro, uh, Denver, urban portions of counties within the Denver metro area. So these are the actual proposed targets, and I'm going to walk through, I'll try not to put us to sleep with too much mathematics, but I'm going to walk through just kind of how we got to this point of, of setting these proposed targets. But for each of these five measures that I showed you on the other slide, these are the proposed targets. Um, I guess a couple points I want to say here. One is that um, even though there's some math involved in this, and we won't get too much in the numbers, as I said, this is not fundamentally a mathematical exercise. These, these, are, these are people's lives that we're talking about, and we cannot engineer or mathematically calculate our way to targets. We needed to come up with a methodology to get to this point, uh, to turn something in uh, to the state and to the feds, but I want to be clear, this is, this is people's lives here, right? The, you know, sort of on that point, you know, let's also acknowledge that, you know, long term, the only correct number on this slide is zero, and that's something that we're all working towards, again, both here at Dr. Cog and all of you in your local jurisdictions. Uh, but again, for this specific federal requirement that we have of the five-year rolling average, we needed to come up with targets addressing that time period. So just a little bit to get into, you know, how did, how did we do this? Um, and again, one thing we need to think about, because it is five years, 2014 to 2018, you know, four of those years are already done, right? So our ability to affect change on this first round of targets is actually pretty limited. As we go through this over the next several years and we think about some of the things that we're doing here at Dr. Cog, you know, we're about to have our tip call that you're going to talk about tonight. Um, things that you all are doing in your local jurisdictions, the Vision Zero efforts that are ongoing, other things that all of us and all of you are doing about safety. Over time, those will sort of permeate into future target setting uh, that we'll be able to do. But again, for tonight, we're concerning ourselves with the period 2014 to 2018. In, in that period of which four of those years are already gone, nothing we can do about. Um, so we're trying to be both assertive, uh, but also realistic about what we can do within this first time frame. So having said that, um, where we started as staff was really looking at our adopted MetroVision regional plan. We actually have a performance target in MetroVision that talks about uh, reducing annual traffic fatalities. Uh, kind of over here at the bottom on the left side of this, uh, of this slide, uh, we have a performance target of fewer than 100 fatalities annually by 2040. So we basically did the math on what it would take to get to that point by 2040 and annualize, annualize that year by year to help us kind of set this first round of targets. So when you do that, when we start talking about fatalities as the first measure that we need to set a target for, um, the, uh, in the upper right here in the blue uh, of this top graph is actual number of fatalities within our region over the past several years. And then the green ones for 2017 or 2018 are starting to apply that annualized MetroVision methodology uh, to start working our way towards 2040. So the top graph is annual fatalities. The bottom graph is that five-year moving average because, again, the targets that we need to set are that five-year sort of average. So first we look at actual numbers, then we, then we look at five-year, rolling five-year averages. So you see the uh, circle here, 242.4. That relates back on this slide, the 242, the proposed target for fatalities. Um, so that's the first measure, annual fatalities. And actually, there's the legend for it. Um, we also look at fatality rate. Um, so I won't go through the methodology because it's the exact methodology I described. The difference here, the fatality rate is sort of um, it's normalized by, in this case, per 100 million vehicle miles traveled. So the first one is just straight up fatalities. This one is a rate uh, per miles driven. So that's our second measure. 
The third measure is serious injuries. Here we didn't have our Metro Vision plan guidance on serious injuries. And in fact, we, uh, we know or we think we know that if we are uh, collectively successful in reducing fatalities over time, serious injuries might actually even go up a little bit, right? So here we looked at this and we said, what if we hold the line, just literally hold the line on the number of serious injuries? Um, given our uh, rapidly increasing population growth in Metro Denver, as well as our increasing vehicle miles traveled over the last few years, even just holding the line in this very short term, I think would be somewhat of a victory. So again, this is what you see here. The blue is the actual numbers of serious injuries through 2015, and then just literally kind of holding that line through 2018. Again, first actual numbers um, on the top, and then that rolling five-year average on the bottom to get to the proposed target. Serious injury rate is just like fatality rate. Um, in this case, again, we're normalizing it by um, a rate of per 100 million vehicle miles traveled, uh, but the methodology is the same as I've been describing. So that's our fourth measure. And then our final measure um, that the feds uh, require us to set a target for is um, a combined measure of non-motorized fatalities and serious injuries. So we kind of broke that up into its two pieces. For the fatalities piece of it, we did apply our MetroVision plan methodology, that same sort of percentage decrease that we used for total fatalities. Uh, we applied here as well, again, annualizing that to get to our target uh, for 2040. And then for serious injuries, just as with total serious injuries, we used the hold the line approach uh, to calculate that piece of it. Uh, again, using the actual numbers on top and then the five-year rolling average on the bottom. And then we put those two numbers together and we come up with our, um, for this measure, this combined measure, the 300, basically 346 is our sort of combined uh, target for this measure. So again, when you put that all together, um, same numbers as you saw about you know, 10 slides ago. These are our proposed targets with the methodology that we used um, to calculate them. Again, these are our 2018 targets for the period 2014 through 2018. We will do this again in a year um, and presumably for each year thereafter. Um, so we are looking for a motion. I will say the Transportation Advisory Committee and the Regional Transportation Committee uh, both approve this. We are asking you uh, to adopt this tonight by resolution so that we can send it in to CDOT. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Director Rakowski. As those of you that have heard me for many years say, job one at the municipal local level is public safety. This is public safety. There is nothing we do that is more important than this particular uh, action. I think I want to give a shout out to Mayor Hancock for adopting Vision Zero. And at the state level, Executive Director Lewis, thank you uh, for getting CDOT involved in Vision Zero. It's a way to reduce accident fatalities, and the fatality you're reducing may be your own family member or a friend. So again, I think this demands unanimous approval by this body. Director Jones. So I would make a motion that we approve a resolution adopting the 2018 safety targets. We have a motion and a second discussion. I wanted to make one comment, and this may go without saying, but um, it's, this is one of the things where we can see the, the staff putting in the hard work to implement the Metro Vision that this body worked so hard on last year, uh, putting together the, the, the basis for the Metro Vision plan, and, and now staff is working very hard to implement it, so I want to compliment staff on that. Uh, any other discussion? We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, aye. Opposed, nay, and I will note that it's unanimous. Thank you. Uh, before I move on to the next agenda item, I mentioned earlier that we had a new member from Inglewood, and uh, she was ac actually joined us since I mentioned it earlier, so I wanted to introduce Linda Olson, the new member from Inglewood. And the next item we have is agenda item 11, which is under attachment D. Mr. Cottrell. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good evening, everyone. So after the end of fiscal year, federal fiscal year 17 in October, uh, Dr. Cog consulted with CDOT and RTD to review all the project phase status of those projects with fiscal year 17 funding. Um, in addition to those projects that were delayed for a first time last year contained within the fiscal year 16 report. So after con confirmation from CDOT and RTD, 
Um, Dr. Cog's staff contacted the sponsors with the project phases that were not initiated to do two things. One is to find out the reasons for those delays, and to two, um, assist them in developing a plan going forward to initiate the project phase or phases that were delayed. So the attached uh, report summarizes the project phases that were not initiated as of sub September 30th of 2017. Uh, this report summarizes that three project phases were delayed for a second year. Um, in October, each appeared before this board to ask for a uh, seek a variance in the TIP policy to continue. Each were granted a 120-day extension. Of those three, uh, the Denver project has already met its conditions and is no longer delayed. Um, and as we just found out this afternoon, the Boulder County project will meet its conditions tomorrow. And finally, the North Glen plot project, after uh, consulting CDOT, should meet those conditions within the next two weeks by January 29th. Uh, in addition to those three projects, there were 17 projects that were first year delayed, in which four have already uh, been initiated and no, are no longer delayed. So your motion to approve the staff recommendation this evening would allow them to continue. Um, with that, I'll take any comments or questions that you may have. Comments or questions? So I will point out that I asked Mr. Rex because I, I couldn't remember from last year if 17 first year delays was unusual. And he told me that we have between 15 and 20 a year. Last year we had 19. So having 17 first year delay is not an abnormality. That's, that's pretty average. So discussion? I'd entertain a motion. I just have a motion and a second. All those in favor, aye. aye. Opposed, nay. Thank you very much. Agenda item 12, which is under attachment E, Mr. Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Give me a second here now. Let me pull this up. All righty. Well, thank you very much. Um, yeah. I, I, uh, before I begin, though, I, I wanted to want to just real quickly just tell you just a quick story. Um, so I was in Jerry Stegall's office early, earlier this week, or maybe it was late last week. Now I think about it, and just talking about this agenda item and you know where it was going to go and all that kind of good stuff. And we were talking, and Jerry said something. I know I go in there for sage advice all the time, but he said something, and I don't know if this is his quote or not, but I'm going I'm to share it with you. He said, "The best organizations don't try to create the perfect solution. Um, after or with careful, thoughtful discussion, they try something." And I think that's kind of where we are in this whole process. I mean, we're not in the business of fixing. We're, we're in the business of trying to improve this process. And I know there's a lot of consternation with this new, you know, because it's new, right? I mean, we all, and we're, you know, there's going to be warts along the way, and we know that. And, uh, but I think it's in, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a process that we're going to try. We're going to pilot and uh, see where we go with it. But the, uh, the agenda item itself is gonna, not going to look much different to you. It's something you saw last, uh, last month, of course. Um, and we will you know, have a discussion. And, and if, uh, if it pleases the board, um, you know, I would like to divide it up like we did last time to talk, talk about the, uh, the framework for, for the regional share eligibility and then have a discussion about the, uh, the funding split. And then this is where that comes in. You know, when we, when we, for the new folks, when we get, get the clickers out, it means something. <laughs> it means you know, this is an important item. So we'll get into that just in, just in a little bit. But, but again, this is primarily for the new folks in the room, just talking about what this new process is. So um, back, back after our, our last tip, when we developed the tip, we, we, as we always did, we uh, did a kind of a, what we call, at least internally, a tip post-mortem to just see about if there's ways uh, you know, to improve our process, what went right, what went wrong, all those kind of things. And, and it was suggested um, by the board that Dr. Dr. Cox's staff convene a uh, tip at the time it was called the Tip Review Work Group to look at how other regions around the country develop their their tip process. Right. So we did that, and really there was really you know there was really only two ways. There was a more centralized process that Dr. Cog currently had, in which all our member local governments they submit projects directly to Dr. Cog, and we score those projects in two phases. Is what we used to be, what we we've done in the past. Um, then the other pro approach was a more, more decentralized or a kind of a dual model is what we refer to it as, where there was a regional pot and a sub-regional pot. And that is the model that the uh, board wished us to pursue a little more, which we did. And we provided you all with a, with a uh, white paper or two related to uh, 
related to this process. So that finds us here today in our, in our, in our, in our discussion. So but I think the important thing, again, to point out in this whole process is that the Dr. Cog Board ultimately has the authority and has ultimate uh, uh, approval of the projects that are selected. So not only those that are in the regional pot, but those that are in the sub-regional pot. So the process will be such in that uh, once uh, the sub-regional forums are formally uh, uh, established and uh, they uh, uh, develop what their, their process, their criteria is going to be for the selection of process projects, and we'll get into that as we go, f go uh, forth through the months here. Um, they will then recommend a, a, a package of projects to the board. And, uh, you know, I, I would suggest that what would happen would be the, the chair of that sub-region, sub-regional forum would come and present. And uh, present to you all why that package of projects was selected. Why and how it, uh, how it um, um, it was consistent with the three focus areas that the board has selected, how it was consistent with the long range transportation plan, the tenants of Metro Vision, those types of things. So, uh, so that's the process. And then ultimately the board will have the authority to approve or not that the, the, the project, the package or projects that might be contained within that package. So I think that's very important to point out that in order for this process to work, and quite frankly, in order for us to be in compliance with federal law, that uh, the Dr. Cog board ultimately has the authority. So, um, so what am I doing? So on the uh, regional share uh, eligibility framework, let's talk about that real quick. So we provided you all with uh, the TIP policy work group's recommendation at the last meeting. And um, since that time, and based on some of the discussion that was had at the, at the December 20th board meeting, the uh, TIP Policy Work Group did re reaffirm you know, their recommendation that they provided to you, but they also made a couple of additional revisions, which, is, which are shown on Attachment 1. Uh, nope, that's not right. Yeah, yeah Attachment 1. And it's, it's redlined. So at the last discussion there, you know, we had originally proposed, when I say we, I say the TIP Policy Work Group, we'd originally proposed a maximum of two um, submittals from each sub-regional forum for, for the regional share. And uh, whether, while there was no f formal direction associated with that, I think those that were at the last meeting of the TIP policy, those TIP policy work group members that were at the board meeting, we believe that there seemed to be trending towards three per, per, uh, per sub-region. So we made that change. And of course, that's just a recommendation of us. You, you're more than welcome to change that, uh, uh, as you know. The other, uh, there were two other changes. The other change was that we, we had suggested two options for you with regards to um, the amount of funding any one project could get. Uh, there was one that basically there was no, no limit. And then the other option was um, basically that uh, no one project could exceed 50% of the total project cost and that would be capped at $20 million. And um, after f further discussion of the board, of the TIP Policy Work Group, we decided to just make, make life a little easier for you this evening because we know we're going to have plenty of discussion and suggest one. And we suggested the, uh, that there be a 50% total cap and a $20 million. So um, again, that is just the recommendation for, for your consideration this evening. And last but not least, we had a discussion about the studies. And, uh, and this is at the bottom of, of attachment one. Um, you will see that uh, what struck out is that uh, it suggests that um, uh, any project for the, any study for a project that is Dr. Cog eligible, that crosses county boundary would be eligible. Well, we had a pretty good discussion about that. And we all actually felt with regards to eligibility, right? Now this is different than how studies or any other projects would actually score that we felt that any project that was eligible um, for Dr. Cog funding should at least be considered, right? Because we looked, we talked about originally like, you know, primarily would be, you know, these large, bigger studies like NEPA studies and those types, you know, larger corridor ones. But then we started talking about, well, you know, we've also funded some other types of studies such as um, in the last call, we uh, funded a regional BRT study through our, uh, our TD submittal. Um, so we want to make sure that those types of projects were eligible too. So I think what we, would, we will end up doing, and you'll see this when we bring back to you our recommendation for regional share criteria, is that we will tear those studies so that, um, 
I'm not going to, because I don't know what, how those are going to be tiered, but I would suggest to you that those, the types of projects that I just mentioned would probably uh, be higher priority than others. Um, and again, we felt, I think there was some concern on the studies that, you know, that there would be, you know, anything and everything would be submitted. But again, this is all kind of, um, um, it's all coordinated because each subregion, based on our recommendation, would only get three submittals. So there will have to be some careful thought about what would be submitted. So we suggest that it would only be larger, larger studies and, quite frankly, larger, larger projects that would even probably be submitted. So with that, I'll leave it there. Um, everything else is the same as was, uh, was uh, presented to you all in the last month. Uh, but I'd be happy to take any questions you might have about the, the uh, eligibility framework. Questions or comments? Excuse me, Director Peck. Um, on, whoops, thank you. I got some notes from my staff that I would like to uh, bring to your attention. Um, they are concerned with um, page 39, the second bullet on page 39, which basically says that uh, the operational projects are eligible on any segment of the freeway and MRA networks. Longmont would like to see the sub-regional allocation allow operational projects on the regional roadway system, which would include State Highway 66 and State Highway 52. Uh, is there any possibility for yes. that? Yes. Those is. would be eligible. And quite frankly, anything that's on this map. But they're, they're not on that map. The well, I, as long as they're... Uh, so in the sub-regional pool, basically anything on our regional roadway network would be eligible. On the network, not necessarily the map. Correct. Okay, thank you. Yeah. That was it? Steve, that's right, isn't it? Yep, okay. <laughs> Other questions or comments? Mr. X? Thank you, sir, very much. Um, okay, so we'll get into the funding split now. Is everybody happy with that? Okay. So... This is gonna, you're going to lose this for a second. Okay. We can come back to it. Obviously. Okay, I'll just close this. Let's try this again. <laughs> Go. <laughs> I'm going to close all of these. That would have that would have been anticlimactic. No, I. Yeah. Indeed, Correct. indeed, that is the first question. That's the test question. No, um, no, I, I we uh, you know after discussing a little bit you know about this meeting with the executive committee and all. Um, you know, I thought it would be a good idea just to get a clear understanding of where we are with this, right? Um, you know, because I know we've got some new faces in the room this evening, so we kind of wanted to just establish some data points about where we are. And that's all this is. This is basically, this is a fancy straw poll just to begin our discussions since this evening. And it, i just like to echo the uh, comments that Director Kanish made earlier with regards to us being a collaborative body. And we truly are. Um, and y you guys don't know, but, you know, nationally, we... <laughs> You know, the, the platitudes that we receive for the work that we do around this table is, uh, is pretty impressive. Um, and, and we are. And um, it is my hope this evening, as I'm sure it is with you all, that we can come to some collaborative uh, conclusion to this discussion and, and uh, get on to the next discussion with regards to all this. So what we, um, so what we did here this evening, um, you know, what, what, we in, what we hope to accomplish with this is obviously to uh, make a decision on, on what that, what that uh, funding allocation should be between the two pots. 
And uh, that little note at the bottom is basically just restates that, you know, this, this, is, this is a pilot. And, you know, I, I know you guys have got a copy of the Federal Highways letter, and they see it that way, and I think we all see it this way. We'll, you know, once this is done, we'll, we'll do the analysis and reevaluate and see what, what we did is, is correct, whether this is better than the process we had in the past, and uh, all that kind of good stuff. So this is, you know, it's, it, this is fluid stuff, but it's, uh, it's obviously very important stuff, too and we're hoping that we can improve our process. So the polling question that, um, that we want to throw out to you all this evening is, is this. Uh, which of these allocation options, which I'll show you here in a minute, it's basically the ones that are in your packet, will best help us meet our regional objectives and outcomes? Um, so, the, so the three are here. Now let me tell you how to use the clicker. Maybe Brad should tell you how to use the clicker. But I think ultimately, so I think you only have to worry about the top line. Um, so you choose one of the three, right? So you have A, B, or C. It's like one slash A, one, two slash B, blah, blah, blah. So you, you choose one. And if, if you choose the wrong number, you can, you can just press and select another answer and it, it you can do that as long as the polling is open so don't feel you messed up and you can't you, you can't change your vote so um, so without further ado well, let, is let there me, any questions let me mention one thing because uh, executive director mentioned this but since you just said vote I just want to clarify this yeah. isn't a binding vote this is this is a straw poll we're just trying to get a sense of the room um, but since you said the word vote I want to make sure <laughs> very good everybody understood that no Appreciate that for sure. So, Brad, is there anything I need? Is there any questions hold, before we hold do on, this? Hold on one second. Yeah. Director Bean, can, can you can you use? Excuse me, sir. Can you use the mic, please? Oh, I didn't know we had to do that. Uh, I'm usually loud enough. Uh, Thirty, the regional and sub-regional. Can you please explain those one more yes, time? Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, sir. Well. Uh, you know, this is part of this new model that we're that we're anticipating using. Um, it's it's a it's a dual model, right? So there's two pots that are eligible. There's a regional pot and a sub-regional pot. So in the regional pot, projects that would be would be uh, would, that would be eligible for selection are those that are included in the maps of this agenda item this evening. So it would be your larger projects, right? Those on freeways. Uh, those on uh, major regional arterials. It could be, uh, you know, uh, larger rapid transit corridors, larger bicycle pedestrian, or, yeah, I guess pedestrian cor corridors, and those types of things. So it's the larger, meatier, big projects, right? Big regional projects. Um, the sub-region, what we, what we propose to do with that is basically, there, in the sub-regional pot, we would proportionately allocate that sub-regional share out to these eight sub sub regional forums, uh, these it's a sub geographic unit of Dr. Cog, right? So, and we've we've decided to use counties to do that. So each county would then establish a sub regional forum. So every community with uh, uh, within that county would uh, be invited to participate on this this committee that would make a determination of uh, of ultimately making a recommendation of projects in your area back to the full board, right? So um, I don't know if there's any more. Yeah, I, I mean, that, that's basically the, the crux of it. Thank you, sir. Got it. So uh, just so the newer members are aware of it, the reason that we use the mic is not to be heard necessarily, but so it's on the record. Um, it goes When it goes through the mic, it's on the record. Um, real quick, I wanted to, I mentioned this before, but Again, since we have a number of new members, um, and Director, Executive Director Rex uh, talked about this some, but um, the way that we used to do the TIP allocation was by project type. So all of a particular type of project, let's use bike pad as an example, all of the bike pad projects that individual municipalities submitted were ranked against each other to determine what, which ones would receive funding through the TIP process. And to give you an idea, and I think this is on one of the slides, but we're talking about in the neighborhood of 280 to $300 million. So that's how we used to do it. This is the new methodology that we're talking about now with the regional and sub-regional and not doing it by project type, but the regions and sub-regions doing, uh, doing it that way. Um, I, I, 
have uh, Director Zabel and then Director Kanich in the in the queue. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I, I excuse me, Director Kanich. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess two questions, um, and I, I think we're probably all slow warming up because when you said, "Is there any comments?" So I think we all kind of looked at each other, like, "Are we talking now or are we talking after the straw poll?" Um, but one thing I'm concerned about is that I don't see an option here for undecided or unsure, especially given that we have folks. This is first meeting. Um, we did have a pretty thorough debate about this last time, but they might not have had a chance to, to hear all those. I just am curious about can you add a D that's undecided at this point or it's pre-programmed and you can't do that? Yeah. Well, it's possible. So, yeah, so it is. And so I don't know, I don't desire. want to speak for folks who are new or maybe who are undecided. I, I guess if, if, if maybe I'll just throw it out there and if someone agrees that's necessary, I won't put you through it. I, again, I'm just, I'm trying to, you know, be thinking about how we have a good debate and yeah, folks good. are feeling, you know, straw polls can be helpful for shaping the discussion after if that's yeah. our intention, but. Yes, sure. Yeah, that, and I should have explained that probably a little better, Director Kanich, that we will, we'll, we're going to do the straw poll through the, through the pad and then we're going to, I'm sure, have a very thorough discussion on the results of that straw poll. So uh, I, I think for now we'll, we'll leave it at, as the way we have it and, and then we can certainly have. And, and I would encourage, again, since we have a number of new members, please don't hesitate to ask questions. There's, there's nothing off limits and, and we'll get through the, the questions and comments thoroughly. So Director Kanich. Just one other option. Does the clicker count the undervote, like if folks just choose not to vote? Well, it, or is, will we, like, do we know how many clickers are out there? Yeah, it just records the number of clickers, right? Okay. Got it. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, we have one at every, yeah, one clicker per, per and, oh, yeah. <laughs> Does everybody have a clicker? Just here. Just take Okay. Director Champion. Is everyone eligible to vote? All, all members are eligible to vote. Alternates are not, and there are a couple of non-voting members. Right. Thank you. Uh-huh. And, and we're not voting. Excuse me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Touching our nose or wiggling our ears or whatever we're doing. Yeah. Okay. So are we, we ready? Any, any other questions before we do this? What's that? What if I was touching it before? Is that going to count? Nope. No. Uh -uh. Yeah, I, I was adding it will only record your last vote, right? So if you change your mind up and at the very last second, it will take that last vote. So if this conversation has changed how you feel and you've already selected something, reselect and it will count that vote. No, I was trying to figure out what it was when I walked yeah. in the door. That's not going to count, right? Oh, no, you're good. You're good. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, Brad, do I, is there anything we need to do? Yeah, tell them to vote. Um, the only thing that I would add is that um, if you do want a little bit more background, there is information in your packet that sort of lays out the sort of, let's call it the financial implications of what this looks like in terms of the, the funding associated with the, the regional share and the sub-regional share if you want additional information on that. Yeah, thank you, Brad. That is true. So the three scenarios that we're voting on here this evening. Now, I will say, because um, uh, actually the, the chairman actually uh, alerted me to this, that the $280 million that we're using on this, I know I've said this before, that that is just an estimate, right? We don't know exactly how much money we're going to get. We hope to have a better understanding of that over the next month or so, but that is just an estimate, and that's why we're really concentrating on the percents. So if there's no further question, I'll open up the voting in two, one, go. You're already up to 43, which I don't know. looks about that's, like that. That's, that's yeah. not correct. Yeah. It's, it's right. Director is right up here. So I think we're. That's probably everybody. I think that's everybody. Boy, you guys, you guys didn't wait for the for the whistle. Just advance the slide. Just advance it. Yep. Yep. So here we go. Here we go. So, I, mean, I, I don't know if I'll throw it to you, Mr. Chairman, to have a discussion about this. Any thoughts on, on what you see up there on the screen? Director Teal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, 
Uh, no surprise for me, uh, quite frankly. Um, you know, I've had an opportunity to speak with um, uh, several other board members uh, since our last meeting in December. We had a great conversation back in December. Um, um, I'm happy to see that, quite frankly. I think, uh, I think the 80-20 split is the way to go, folks. Um, you know, it, it, I, I, I give it to Director Odoricio, who really laid out the, uh, the, the concept that I would put forward. Uh, this goes back to local control. We can sit and talk about meeting as a uh, region all we want, but the reality is it's, it's our local entities, starting with us talking to our constituents and then partnering up with our neighboring communities that where our regionality really begins. So, I mean, I think this is great. Um, I, uh, when, it, when it obviously comes time to uh, have discussions the way we normally have discussions, I certainly encourage us all to consider the 80-20 uh, split. I think that's the superior way to go. And charting a bold course, uh, the executive director talked about how, well, you know, we're thought well of among the other COGS. I think this is a bold course for us to take and uh, fully appropriate. Director Baker. I want to echo um, Director Teal's comments and um, our transportation forum in Arapahoe County with all of our towns and, and uh, cities that are part of Dr. Cog, we've been meeting and this is uh, the consensus of, uh, of that group, the Arapahoe County Transportation Forum. And uh, so I agree that we should seriously look at that 51% and if there's any other uh, polls being done, um, whether that number changes. I would estimate that it probably goes up. Director Jones. Well, I, so I'm going to provide an alternative perspective. If you add up the 37 and 12, 49 percent to 51 percent, you can see that the group is pretty divided somewhere along this. Um, I think it's important to realize that the subject matter experts on, on the TIP working group had put forward a recommendation of 70-30 as a bold move, um, which is a, a, a radical departure from how we did um, the TIP in the past. And we were modeling it largely after Puget Sound, which doesn't go as far as 70-30. It's more in the 65-35. And the idea was to pilot a new TIP process, see how it works, um, and to have a balance between um, uh, the sub-regional discussions around smaller tables while still having an opportunity to fund big regional region-changing transformative projects and to leave enough in, in the regional pot in order to do that. Um, the experts on the TIP working group suggested 70-30 would be a good place to start. That's the staff recommendation. And I guess I would encourage us, I think somebody else said it on a prior meeting, to walk before we run. We have the opportunity to evolve down this pathway if we like it, if it works well. But it is completely untested in our region. We haven't done it. We're, we're modeling it after something somebody else has done, and we're trying it on. So uh, I would caution us from going too far in our first step and to, to really take a hard look at the staff recommendation and the TIP working group recommendation of 7030 as a good place to start piloting a brand new process. Director Odoricio. Uh, I, I interpret that as being 63 versus 37 <laughs> instead of the 49 versus 51. I'm just joking. Um, no, I, I think that what we've got here is uh, it, it, it's, it's clear that I think a lot of people are ready to try something different. And um, regardless of how we have this, I think that how really the proof is in the pudding of how the projects that the subregions put forward to the major group, uh, to the group as a whole, will still need to be done through with Dr. Cog criteria uh, met along the way. And I look forward to working with our uh, subregions that are around us and even um, everyone to still work on that 20%. So I think we're, we're moving in the right direction. 
Director Maurer. Since I'm new, I had help with this. Um, so I'm just going to read it. Centennial supports the 20 80 percent funding split between the regional and sub regional shares. We found with the perimeters placed on regional projects and the larger sub regional share of funding, this will allow for adequate sub regional project funding. Without these mechanisms, some member gov governments may not be able to participate and therefore diminish the overall effectiveness effectiveness of the dual model to promote geographic equity. Sufficient funding must be made available at the local level um, and to not only encourage participation but to allow for that project's work to be done. Director Stolzman. Thank you, Chair. We've set some pretty bold goals in our Metro vision. Um, we're trying to improve air quality right now. We're out of attainment for ozone levels, and that has real impacts on families, children with asthma. Um, people are legitimately sick from that, and we have a responsibility through this transportation funding um, to try to address that. We set goals for safety. We set goals uh, for congestion because we know people are frustrated with the congestion getting to and from work, and that has real impacts on the economy. Um, so I take it very seriously how we spend the funding, and I think it's um, undeniable that we don't have enough funding to fund all of the projects. So because of that, I think it's critically important that we fund the most important projects first, the next most critical project that will help the most people in our region. And so, you know, coming from a small community, I hate to say it, but if you funded something in my city, it probably won't have the same kind of impact as if we fund something that everybody in my city uses to get to work every day, but maybe it's not within my jurisdiction. And that's what really a regional project is. Uh, people in my jurisdiction and your jurisdictions don't stay within our boundaries. We go all over. Um, I don't remember if you all saw in the news last year when the person had um, the measles or something like that, and it listed all the places that he had gone to and that everyone needed to go watch out, and it was Parker, Lone Tree, Louisville, Boulder, Denver, and this was like in like, you know, five hours or something like this. This guy had contaminated the whole region. <laughs> so pe people do move all about, and so that's why I think it's really important to have enough money in the regional pool of funding that we can do some big projects. And so... While the 80-20 split seems tempting because you could fund some more local projects uh, with the 80% versus the 70, it's really not as significant of an increase as it is what you're taking away from the regional type projects. So if we go with 80-20, there's really just the I-70 project and one other regional project. That's kind of how I see it. Um, and I really think those regional projects are where you get the biggest bang for your buck. So I'm more supportive of the 70-30. I actually would be more supportive of an even, if there were more ratios for me to choose from, you know, negative of A, I probably would have gone that direction for a first start. Uh, but I, I really think 70-30 is the way to go. Thanks. Okay, so at, in the queue I've got Kanich, Pfeiffer, Brockett, and Gutwein. Um, Director Kanich. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I was one of the folks who um, was very supportive of us looking at the Puget Sound model um, because it seemed like it would help to respond to some of the concerns that have been raised at this table. And, you know, I did that with the understanding that their, their starting point is 50-50. So in my mind, that was, you know, the one model we were looking at with 10 years of experience. And, and so I think um, I hear the values that folks are articulating about the need to fund projects in the local areas and I, I I fear that there's been kind of a false choice set up either you're funding some mysterious regional project that's happening somewhere else or you're funding a project that's happening in in your county and that's really not the choice the tip the only thing that changes in these scenarios is where the decision making is occurring Local smaller projects and medium-sized projects get funded, right, in, in, in either scenario. It's kind of about where the decision-making is. So like the map that has the MRAs, these are, these are roads running through the communities all over. It's not just I-25 and I-70. It's not just, you know, C-470. It's, it includes some of these other regional arterials. So, so I think that um, 
I, I fear I would like to just I think talk less about it's not about taking money away from a, a community and moving it to another it's about where the decision making lies and so one of the things that just in terms of the implications here we're talking about the difference of 44 million dollars available for regional projects or um, 21 million dollars so so this is a pretty stark difference if you if you kind of look um, you know at the list on page 55 you can see some of the price tags associated with projects some of the subregions could never fund a project ever because their subregion is like 18 million for um, uh, I think it's a uh, uh, Boulder uh, 18 million for Douglas uh, Broomfield at 4 million for those folks to ever do a project near the 20 million dollar cap they are going to have to look to the regional pot and if the regional pot has 20 million dollars in it there will not be enough for those types of things so so it's I, I it's not in my in my voting and supporting uh, the 30 70 split you know, it moved, I've already moved. I mean, we, the way we've talked about this at the last board meeting is it was a compromise. The model, and I think it was me, literally, who suggested Puget Sound as something to look at, was 50-50. <laughs> and so I think that the question of should this body as a whole make a decision about one or two projects, or should it make a decision about four or six projects in debating priorities? It's not about whether or not projects will happen in these surrounding areas. If you look at this list on page 56, our prior TIP funded projects throughout the region. The same types of projects will be funded, but the decision making and the prioritization will happen through some more collaboration at this body. So, so it's just a slightly different way of framing it um, than my colleagues who spoke prior. It's not about choosing between who gets funded. It's about how the decision gets made, and it's about whether there's enough, especially for your, the smaller counties that, that don't have huge allocations, they'll never be able to fund a big project on their own. So if the regional pot doesn't have enough, there won't be, you know, a Wadsworth, for example, at $25 million, right? That's more than the entire regional pot under the 2080 split. Wadsworth could not be funded. So just pointing that out. Thanks. Director Pfeiffer. Thank you, Chair. I would uh, echo both um, Director Kanich and Director Salzman on their comments. Um, I looked at it at, even at a micro level of the fact that we are debating $2 million. If I was looking at the county level, we're debating about $2 million as a county, um, you know, giving that, say, back into the pot. And so, but when you put everyone's $2 million back into the pot, say we were 80-20, we put them back into the pot, then that is $16 million worth of uh, regional money that can have a big impact. My staff and my council uh, has uh, advised me that the 70-30 split is best for the region um, because there are projects like Robin was referring to that are very interesting to our community that don't lie in our community. Our I-70 and Kipling interchange is a horrible intersection. It's not in Arvada, but most of our community goes through that interchange. That will never get funded. Again, I'm echoing what Robin said. We'll never get funded if the regional pot doesn't have enough money to cover it. So um, our community would be in favor of a 70-30. Okay, just as an update in the queue, I have Brockett, Gutwein, and Teal. Director Brockett. Thanks. Well, <clears throat> a lot of what I wanted to say has been said, but I just want to say, uh, Director Teal, you made some excellent points about a move towards local control in a kind of a bold stroke forward. But I think we get those in either scenario. I think the 70-30 and the 80-20 accomplish those goals of local control for, you know, the large majority of the funding. Um, and to me, it just comes down to those numbers that um, th with the 80-20 split, you only get the $21 million for regional projects. And this is, this is for three years, right? So this is, um, it's essentially one major project in the entire region in a three-year period. Uh, versus uh, the 70-30 split gets you uh, at least 44 million. So it's, it's a really big difference to the regional amount of money. It's well more than double. Um, and I just, I feel like this body should have an impact on regional transportation. And with that 80-20 split, we don't really get to accomplish that. Director Goodwin. Thank you. Um, a lot of what I wanted to say has been said already, but um, I met with our staff and they also recommend doing a 70-30 split um, and the main reason was that 
For one thing, um, we want to make sure that there's enough money in the sub-regional pot that there are worthwhile projects that we can do that make it, it's enough money to make this whole change worthwhile, but that we also want to make sure we have enough um, money in our regional pot so that we can do, and he mentioned so that we could do at least three to four regional projects. Um, and now we're talking about being able to do just one, one potentially regional project. Um, and then when I think about our community um, in Lakewood, we're definitely facing a lot of um, growth pressures. You heard a little bit about the 1% growth initiative um, at the last meeting. And so one of the main um, concerns that comes up is traffic. And so I think that uh, to best serve our community, which is you know, in the middle of 6, 25, 70, 470, um, we have WADS running all the way through. Um, we really need to have uh, enough money to address some of those regional um, congestion issues. Um, so I will be supporting uh, doing 7030. Thank you. Director Teal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So um, I wonder, Doug, could we perhaps take a look at the uh, attachments that actually have the monetary divisions out? Perhaps starting with the 80-20 and uh, having the 70-30 probably close at hand. If I can figure it out, let me see here. Oh, that's the wrong one. Brad, can I get yeah. to the other one? Yeah. I just don't want to look at this. Don't let me do that. We can come back to this. No pressure, buddy. You got it, man. You're on top of it. Is there one in particular you wanted to look at? Mr. Yeah, let's let's go ahead and go to the uh, 8020 if we could, please. So guys, I mean, we're we're talking, you know, we're trying to talk about, well, how much could be spent in that regional pot? I'd like us to reflect it back when we started talking about going down this route, when Director Keach did introduce it, and then we started rolling with the idea of doing this regional sub-regional split. The idea is that the regional projects were going to be transformative projects. The sub-regional projects we're going to be projects that, of course, are needed. But those regional projects are going to be transformative. Central I-70 is certainly going to be a transformative project. You can't forget, though, that that true cost that we are allocating Central I-70 is not the $25 million you see right there. It's the $50 million from the prior tip three years ago when I first started. Um, with the board. So, so the, the bottom line is, is that, uh, um, you know, that is the nature of a transformative project. We don't have the money, even if we go with the 7030, to hit that same $50 million price tag. Regardless of which plan we have, I have doubt that we'll have truly have a truly transformative regional project, whether regardless of which one of these models we, we follow. So then it is a matter of trying to divide it up and decide, well, we're already making a compromise. We're already saying maybe we're not going to go with a truly transformative regional project but well, we're going to go with the next best thing. And so we're kind of already breaking the promises we've already made to ourselves about what those regional projects should be. We probably don't have much room in the 80-20 plan for more than one other regional project. So be it. Let's pick the transformative project that is worthy of that regional pot. Everybody up here keeps talking about important sub-regional 
excuse me. The directors that have spoken so far in uh, support of the 70-30 split have brought up these great projects, projects we do want to consider. And at a sub-regional level, they're probably extremely important. And that's probably where the lion's share of that sub-regional pot will be devoted. I guess the point I'm trying to make is that's okay. Let's make these hard decisions. But let's go ahead with an 80-20 allocation that lets us make the hard decision, probably only one, here's a board on what other transformative project we want to fund as a region. But then come together as the sub-regions and then hash it out there what our sub-regional shares need to be. But then, guys, let's go 80-20. Let's make sure our sub-regional projects that are important in those sub-regions have that opportunity to succeed. Uh, I've got Director Vidum, Atchison, and then Jones. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So um, thinking back earlier this evening, we, we heard Mr. Uh, Riger uh, speak about uh, the public safety goals of the state of Colorado. And I believe he said that in 2016, there were 247 fatalities. And the goal was that by uh, 2040, that there would be fewer than 100. Now, we also heard um, uh, Director Rakowski uh, state very correctly that the highest responsibility that a government agency has to the people is to provide for their public safety. Now looking at the, at the, uh, at the project that uh, sets before us tonight, the issue that sets before us, it seems to me that the greatest potential to enhance public safety, to lower uh, uh, fatalities on the highway, lies in sub-regional uh, projects. For example, CDOT has a great passion for uh, traffic circles. And the reason that they have that passion is because when a collision occurs, the speeds involved between the two cars is lower. And I mean, traffic circles, personally, I hate them. <laughs> okay, but so, so I'm gonna put that aside just for a moment. When, it, when a collision occurs in a traffic circle, the speeds involved are lower and the potential for serious injury or death is much lower than in a, a right angle intersection. I do not see uh, traffic circles uh, being forested out of uh, the regional uh, funding. So uh, the greatest thing that this, this board can do tonight uh, to enhance the, uh, the, the safety of the citizens of our region is to support a, an 80-20 project, and that's how I will continue to speak. Thank you. Director Atchison. I wish somebody would come up with a bad argument. <laughs> but there isn't one. You still have a chance. Do I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll get there. But... I haven't heard one person has spoke the last meeting, nor tonight, that's had a bad argument for their position. But we still have to look at it is we commissioned a couple of groups to go out and do the homework for us, our experts, our TIP policy group, and the Dr. Cog staff. And they came back with a recommendation. We talked about this extensively a couple of weeks ago. Where are we at? What do we need to do? But I think the big thing you have to look at is that there's a shared pot in here where we can work together in municipalities that at least are connected, and that's in the sub-regional pot. We can pool our money to do whatever we want, up to including taking on a regional project. But the big point that I've tried to figure out is which is right and which is wrong, and doesn't, in my opinion, doesn't have a real wrong answer. But to most of the arguments we've had is these regional projects are the big ticket items. Where we don't have the opportunity is pooling regional shares, but we have the opportunity to pool sub-regional shares. But if we've got a very small regional share to start with, it's harder to pull all the money into there. 
Plus, we're going to have matching requirements from our own municipalities and counties. But in using the sub-regional share, we can use that as part of our matching funds. So if you look at where we, where we are trying to move the most product, traffic, is on our major arterials. That's going to be 70 and 25, at least from CDOT's standpoint. Yeah, okay, she's still nodding her head up and down. <laughs> Those are our two biggest corridors that bring economy to this state, and we move it around. Now, we've got C-470s that's, that's a partial circle around the city. West Connect is not done, doesn't have the money to finish that part. We've been fighting that one for years. One of these days, Jefferson County is going to just up and pay for it, and we're going to be done. <laughs> right, Libby? Yeah. Don't choke on that. <laughs> but I think what, what we're all trying to do is we all have concepts of what we want to do. And we've had it at least, God, a year. We've been working on this. I feel like it's all I've done for the last four years is talk about TIP policies. What I don't want to do is leave here tonight without a decision and us revert back to the old TIP policy that nobody wants that's been here for a while. And if this is your first night here, take the word of those who've been here for four or five years, that's ugly. And it is very contentious in trying to get anybody to agree to what is the right project. The chair, the staff, the TIP advisory group have said this is our recommendation for the first cycle of this TIP policy. Does it work forever? Maybe not. But we haven't tried it. But if we start out with a low enough number that we can't develop our regional policies to get the most bang and potentially a few more projects other than just one, are we setting ourselves up to come back again in a couple of years and say, we really messed that one up? But it's too late to undo it because we've already made that commitment on those funds and some of those may have already been spent. So I ask you to think seriously about the difference in funds between the 2080 and the 7030. There is a significant amount on your regional share that it doesn't allow for pooling where on the sub-regional share you can pool. And I would ask you to consider that we have more opportunity on a 30-70 split with getting major pieces of road work done than we do on an 80-20. So uh, in the queue, I currently have Jones, Walton, Odoricio, Graves, and Teal. I wanted to, I wanted to uh, interject something myself real quick. I may have misheard, and I don't remember. Uh, I think there's a couple of people that I think said something that made me believe this is where they were going, so I just want to mention it real quick. The sub-regional projects are rated at the sub-regional level, and that sub-region brings it to the board for final approval. So the sub-regional projects are not approved at the sub-regional level alone. They do still come before this board. So I just want to mention that because I thought I, in the conversation somewhere, I thought I heard some allusion to that uh, they're, they're only approved at the sub-regional level and they don't come to this board and that's not correct. So I'm going to start with Director Jones. Well, and this was more relevant a few minutes ago. One, I just want to applaud George Teal being here tonight. It's his 50th birthday and he's <laughs> spending it with us. What can I say? I dig you guys. <laughs> if that's not a twisted mind, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, but I also wanted to point out that the birthday boy made, I think, a very articulate um, argument for why we need more money in the regional pot. <laughs> when he was focusing on the fact that $50 million for Central 70, I haven't heard anybody here suggest that Central 70 isn't a classic regional project that's going to be transformative and very important. At an 80-20 split, we can't fund a transformative project like Central 70. As it was, we split it into two tip cycles. But I think you're arguing, hey, there's not enough money, so we can't do transformative regional projects. And I want to say, wait a minute. 
uh, if we can't do it under our current uh, our um, percentage allocations that we're looking at, that should be a huge wake up call. If we are really about fundamentally uh, making shifts in the traffic congestion in the metro area, we need to do transformative projects. That is what our constituents want. We need to get the biggest regional, regional bang for our buck that touches as many people as possible because we have limited dollars. And if we're saying by approving an allocation that we just can't do transformative projects, then we're heading down the wrong direction. So I, I think we need to really think carefully about our role here as the regional decision makers on, on transportation projects. So I want to give a quick update here. Uh, in the queue, I have Walton, Odoricio, Graves, Teal, Wheelock, Sullivan, Gutwein. Director Walton. We're a regional body, and so I feel like the regional impact should be the greatest. So my support is a, um, for the 30% regional, 70% subregional. Um, I'm interested in, um, again, that same thing um, Director Jones was just saying, the biggest bang. And so for me, it's uh, easy math. I'd rather have the problem of having more regional applications, and I don't think it's going to be to a lack of funding, um, because really these are small dollars overall when we look at all of the projects that we do need to fund. Director Odoricio. Um, I, I appreciate the comments of what we're talking about as far as the regional pot, um, but with the regional pot even being at 80 20, uh, I, I just don't anticipate are we going to have um, a whole lot of projects as big as the Central 70 project coming down the pipe, down the pike? I mean, I don't see any of that at that magnitude coming. I don't know if the state could afford another one just like that. But I do know that there are a lot of other transformative regional projects that have been funded that are going to definitely be covered by that 20 percent. But let's not let the conversation only be about the benefits of what can be purchased with the regional pot. We also should be talking about the dozens of regional projects that will be covered in this sub-regional pot at being at 80 percent. We're going to be able to work together. So I know in Adams County for Highway 85, we're going to work with Brighton and Commerce City. We're going to work with Thornton. I know on highway, if we're working with Boulder and Broomfield on Highway 7, along with Brighton and Thornton and all the cities in the middle. I mean, there are opportunities here. And so while I appreciate us, our discussion on the regional pot, let's also look at the, the greater footprint and the greater impact that having more funding at the sub-regional pot will provide. It's like seed funding. And if you actually look at the most transformative projects that have existed in the regional pot in the past, and I'm talking about Central 70, I'm talking about uh, fast tracks and some of the others, you'll see that Dr. Cog's role in those was really just last in money, right? To help us get across the finish line. Dr. Cog's job was never to, in the past, to carry the, the, main, the, the main burden of those very large regional projects. So we kind of already have some of this 80-20 going on when you look at a lot of these other projects that are being covered by 80% or 70%, those are now just going to be covered by the sub-regional pot. So what I'm getting at is that it's really not that drastic of a change. And if there is something that is so regional and so transformative and it is so persuasive for us to get behind it, we can still contribute from some of our sub-regional money back into that regional project. It just means that we have to work that much more closely to sell the idea. And if it's that good of an idea, then the sub-regions will pitch in. Director Graves. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, I've really taken a lot of time this evening to uh, listen to feedback about the potential projects that could be done out of the regional pot. And I've heard time and time again that many of the directors have difficulty thinking about what actually would fit in that pot. Well, the thing is, it is difficult to think about what presently uh, might fit there, or what historically may have been spent out of the regional pot. This is a regional planning organization that is supposed to have a future orientation. Right now, as we have this debate and we talk about the possibility of an 80-20 split, I think that that is a present orientation. As we work together to try to figure out how to give ourselves the maximum flexibility to pivot, 
to respond to the future needs of the region that we cannot fully predict. How, how old is this organization, Executive Director Rex? 62, 63 years. You pass. I wasn't exactly sure. So 62 or 63 years, okay? So in that time, there have been numerous members who have sat in the seats that we occupy today who could not fully predict what our future regional challenges would be. And so I'm, I'm asking the body this evening to think critically about the people who will occupy these seats after us and the challenges that we cannot fully anticipate. And if we narrow our financial flexibility out of the regional pot, I think that really we are leveling an injustice for this region and its future development. Thank you. Director Teal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, I think we're having a, a great discussion here. I mean, we're, we're really um, hearing from uh, many of the members um, who, you know, who are stating their cases very well. Um, but uh, considering I think this is the third time I've spoken, uh, a couple of us Let's see. One have also spoken uh, more than yep. one time. I think it's probably the point in time, Mr. Chairman, to move to approve the 80-20 regional share framework and sub-regional regional share 80% for the sub-regional, 20% for the regional share, funding allocation for inclusion in the 2020 through 2023 TIP policy documents. Yes. And that's a motion. I do ask for a second, and I'd like the opportunity to speak in favor of the motion. So we have a motion and a second. Um, I'm going to ask for discussion, and I already have people in the queue. So I think it's appropriate that we run down the list of the people in the queue uh, before we ask for further discussion and then um, a, a vote on the motion. So the, direct, the next person is Director Wheelock. Um, yeah, as coming from Clear Creek County, uh, um, I can identify with the idea of having local control and, and the sub-regional split. Um, we are often asked um, uh, in Clear Creek you know, Idaho Springs to Georgetown area, um, to sacrifice for the greater good, uh, the greater goods to either side of us, as a matter of fact. And, and so uh, I identify so strongly with the idea, idea that we should have funds to be able to solve our problems that I wish we did, and I wish we did have that control. As non-MPO members, we don't even have that, though. So initially, I, I voted a little bit ago for the 80-20 split. But looking at the options, I realized that all of these options uh, put locals squarely in control, everything from 80-20 to 70-30. And I also realized that the regional projects touch many more of our communities in one swath and many more lives and uh, also save many more lives. Um, and I just realized this is the Denver Regional rather than sub-regional Council of Governments and that I'm here to collaborate, which we listened to a little bit ago. So I'm I'm switching over and I would invite anyone that um, can see that and feel that way to come with me. Director Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just wanted to say I will not support the motion as it's currently on the floor. Being in a small community, I feel like this methodology change in itself does what it needed to do to benefit the smaller communities to make us more competitive here in the in the, at Dr. Cog for those tip funds. Um, so we feel like you know it makes sense to put the bulk of our money where it could do the most good. So our board last night decided to support the 70-30 split. Uh, I also would say we would probably have supported something more aggressive that was um, more conservative, I should say, in terms of the split. Uh, leaning more toward the regional subshare. So I, I agree with the comments that our first mission here is to be regional first and to improve the lives of as many citizens as we can with these funds. Thank you. Director Gutwin. Thank you. Um, so I kind of as a jokingly but not really jokingly wondering if we could do a straw poll of how many people took 6, 25, 70, or um, Wadsworth within the last week um, because I think that you know my understanding is those projects would be funded in the regional pot and not in the sub-regional is that fair to say they that the highways in both. they could be funded yeah. in both yeah. they're eligible for both pots 
Okay. Thank you. Director Christman. Yeah, Can you use the mic, please? Oh, Thank sorry. you. Comment. Uh, I think Robin hit a key point, and that is this is about where the decision making is initially made to bring forth projects and the criteria upon which those will be made uh, as opposed to having everyone do it and I guess the regional will stay the same. I came in here at the end of the last TIP project and all I heard was bad things <laughs> uh, about uh, that decision making process. Um, I've had the, the um, good fortune to serve on, uh, on the Arapahoe County Committee that is trying to figure out how to do the subregion. I will say that it has driven regional cooperation, particularly because, and I'm assuming this happens elsewhere, particularly because we have communities that breach, that go across county lines. So in trying to figure out how to do this and setting forward, we've already started reaching out to adjoining counties. What do you think of this? What, what works for you? What doesn't work for you? The communities that actually cross county lines are very much in favor of the 80-20 because it addresses their needs that are rather unique. So I would say that this is really talking about a different decision-making process. I think it in fact drives regional cooperation. At least it certainly is what I've seen to date. And I think that it is a little bold. It is a tad bit risky. Um, I would suggest we try being a little bold. I don't think that it will hurt the types of projects that this board ultimately uh, votes on. Thank you. Probably heard bad things and bad words. I heard a lot of bad words. <laughs> Director, <laughs> Director Beacom. Prior to this meeting, I have talked to other directors and then also to the Broomfield uh, staff and, and council. And what I'm hearing, and I think it's maybe it's the concern is that you need the sub-regional to have more money so they can cooperate on what mm -hmm. are maybe not regional projects because they're maybe not transforming process. But they still need to be done. And I'm not sure about the southern half of the Dr. Cog, because I'm not in it very often, but I do know in the northern half, it's easy to go north, it's easy to go northwest, but it's really almost impossible to go east and west. And I hear a lot of people being very concerned about how to solve that congestion of getting from 76 to 36 and everything in between. And I think that's driving a lot of the conversation of 80% to the sub-regional because there's an anticipation that they will work with their neighbors to try to fix some of those problems. And part of the artillery, uh, the, the arteries aren't major in the idea of what they're not. They're not listed, they're not approved as being major arterials. So we're dealing with smaller things that are two lane now that have four lane traffic on them. And that really, I would assume, is the same problem that's going on in the south side as much as on the north side. And so what I hear here is somebody that's trying to get a concept across so that we can solve that problem and fix these not quite regional programs through the cooperation of the sub-regional. And I do think it's a bold stab to cut the money from the regional, but I also hear very much that the sub-regional people are willing to cooperate with each other and with the regional to move forward. 
So we are trying to be very, very bold, as has been pointed out. And it is risky because we have no clue how it's going to actually turn out. But we've got a problem that people are seeing can be fixed by the sub-regional and not by the regional. And that's my comment. And of course, I will abide by whatever the board votes on. But uh, right now, the 2080 doesn't seem impossible. The 730. Um, 7030 also doesn't seem impossible to get the job done. But I think you need to hear why the people like the 8020 mm -hmm. and it has a great impact. So thank you. Director Partridge. Thank you, Mr. Chair. First of all, I have to say this is a, this is a great conversation and to really see the civility that is occurring here is really, frankly, quite boring. Nothing like the British <laughs> Parliament. <laughs> <laughs> you can like pound the table yeah, that's right. and yell out in an accent. Or <laughs> you would have some good adjectives, I know. Mm -hmm. So it, it's really wonderful to see this because it really just spells collaboration as we have it. And whatever we decide, it's going to be, you know, at the end of the night, we're all going to chat and move forward and uh, be thankful that we do have funds available to meet public needs. What I want to comment on is maybe what we've seen in history and kind of what we see at present and what we see coming. And I'm gonna talk mostly in my area and the whole, kind of the whole South Metro, but I kind of talk about it's about three quarters of the area. And when you look at the funding that has been occurred to support some major projects, what do you wanna say, the regional, some regional, and I know we're not talking about toll roads, but you gotta talk about E-470, you gotta talk about the Northwest Parkway and you gotta talk about 470 all the way around. That's three quarters of the region. How many Dr. Cog dollars have gone to E-470? Zero. How many Dr. Cog dollars are going to the present C-470 project? Zero. And if anybody knows that, zero. Whether you can say it wasn't on a long range plan or not, still is zero dollars, but you look at that as a major project. How does that get funded? It gets funded by numerous pools of, of funding, and that's how we've been able to get projects done. It's just not one or two uh, funding mechanisms that per, uh, completes it. And then we talk about what has been identified as the number one project in the state right now, I-25 South. As the plan sets, that is to start construction this November. The only thing that's not funded on it is a 65 million federal grant, which will only be 18 and a half percent of the project. How many of the dollars for that present funding uh, proposal comes from Dr. Cog? Zero. So my point is that we are able to get major regional projects done through sub-regional cooperation. And no doubt that's a lot by CDOT, but it's sub-regional that is getting, the, getting this completed. Now if it comes up to a situation where a, uh, a major regional project is identified, I really believe, seeing what we've done in this room tonight, just in our conversations, we will have the sub-regions come together and say, we will take certain many certain amount of dollars from our sub-regional area and put to a regional project. We will get it done. We will identify it. We've done it on C-470, we've done it on E-470, we've done it on I-25 without even having to come to a regional. So I certainly believe what we have presented to us, the 80-20 is the best option for us to have that freedom and that option to really come as a collaborative approach for us to get things done. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Director Dyack. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is a very polarizing question. It seems like all we're talking about is 70-30 or 80-20. Um, I have an opinion, but I don't think that's relevant at this point. Um, as Director Asherson indicated, that I don't think there's a real wrong argument here. I mean, I think we all see different perspective. It's just about how do we, how do we implement. Uh, we talk about regional share, regional projects. Um, I, I, we have a $9 billion funding gap 
Um, if, if you're coming to us to solve the regional problems, it's going to take 33 years if you take 100% of that, that pool and we get $280 million. So I, again, I mean, we're not CDOT. Uh, we can't create money. Um, we're last dollar in. We're sort of dressing before uh, it goes on and gets fully funded. Um, so I think to me, we're talking 80-20, we're talking 70-30. Uh, we're not talking 25-75. And, you know, maybe that might be some sort of grand compromise and, you know, forgive, forgive the other people who have the same vision as me. But, you know, to me, we're about collaboration. We're about trying to find common ground. And if we're talking about 70-30 and 80-20, there's, there's a common ground option there, which maybe should be at least thought about or considered. So I'll put that out there. Director Shaw. Thank you, Chair. I would echo what Director Dyack just said, um, uh, that that might be where we find our common ground. What I'd also like to say is that it does feel to me like um, our responsibility if we were to get, uh, you know, no matter what our percentage is at the sub-regional level, because the money comes from this body, through this body, we have a very strong responsibility to make sure that we are collaborating with our partners, that we make sure to the best of our ability that our, our sub-regional funds are spent in, in uh, the most collaborative and potentially transformative way. So I would, I would certainly encourage us, no matter what the percentage allocation, that we do look to, um, to the most collaborative use of these funds that we, we can do. Thank you. Thank you. Director Dick. Thank you. I know it's time for us to come to a conclusion, but I'd like to ask, I don't have any answers. I have a question. Do the feds have any influence or any kind of feeling or have they considered what advice they have or blessings they might have before we vote? Uh, by the feds, I think the only people that we've directly heard from is the Federal Highway Administration, and they did not have a recommendation. Um, they're, you know, they were, uh, they, they put their blessing, if that's the correct word, on the idea of what we're doing, but they did not have a recommendation on percentage allocation. Is that correct? No, I, I, I think that's, that's, that's accurate. Um, you know, I think they understand that this is a local decision. And, uh, you know, it is something that this board is going to have to make a determination on what that is. Um, so, you know, it's something, you know, once it's done, once it's complete, you know, we will do our evaluation and, and I'm sure they will too. But they, they see this as a pilot, right? I mean, because this is not done in very many places around the country. Thank you. Director Kelsey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, for right off the bat, I, I wasn't in on the last tip cycle, so um, I was spared the acrimony <laughs> and um, bad words. <laughs> the um, I can see why it was recommended to go elsewhere to look for a model to follow and pattern after. I also defer very strongly to Dr. Cog's staff and the experts that put their heads together and came up with this is the model that we want to, f to try and use and here's the split that we would recommend starting with. And I think that's my primary reason for going with the 30-70 is 
there are people who know more than I do about what's gone before and how this can play out. I also am concerned with shrinking the regional pot to a point where you are limited on how many and what <coughs> kinds of transformative projects you can fund. I think that as a regional council, that's our business is to think regionally and to shrink that to a point where it's, it's not effective. I, th I think we're not serving our, our constituents well. I would be willing to meet in the middle at the 2575 if that helps find common ground. Um, but I'm still, because of the, the expertise that was put into and the thought that was put into developing that recommendation, I still lean towards the 7030. So thank you. Director Rikowski. I've been around here a while. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember Federal Heights when I advocated for them and they fixed an intersection. I remember Lyons when we found money to change their entrance to Rocky Mountain National Park. I'd ask you a basic question. What's Dr. Cog region comprised of? And the answer is 57 jurisdictions. Bomar, Denver, Aurora, Federal Heights. The point is, it's a conglomeration of big and small. And when you get to transformative, I haven't heard anybody speak to their vision, to speak to Director Graves, of the future transformative projects. Are we going to build I-21 and I-72? I don't think so. It's not going to happen. In, in Director Graves has a wonderful daughter. And someday she'll be a grandmother. It won't happen when she's a grandmother. It's not going to happen. So I think we need to think in terms of, for example, air quality. Where do, where do you fix air quality? You fix it at stoplights for, to get cars moving so that it doesn't back up. It's the little things. It's a new right turn lane that keeps traffic moving quicker and relieves congestion on the arterial. And who's in a, the best position to know how to do that? And the answer is the planning department, the public works department in Ar Arvada, the public works department in Littleton, and any other department that you want to know, those folks have an idea at, that can affect and build at the local level. So what I'm saying is, if you really want to talk regionalism, what we've done here is we've brought together 57 jurisdictions. That's the key. And I think that if we give those jurisdictions the opportunity to work together and to take care of small problems, that eliminates the big problems. Director Peck. Thank you, Chair. Well, um, my thought is our staff is supporting the 80-20. Because when we think about regional, when we think about deaths on the highway and congestion, for us, the region is what communities connect to us and that region. So what would really affect our uh, traffic accidents, congestion, and bring different communities together would be putting money toward 287, which count, you know, uh, crosses many counties, a lot of collaboration, and uh, a lot of traffic congestion. So. Um, I agree with Director Christman that uh, it is the small communities that work together to get the people safely to the large arterials. So we are supporting the 80-20 the in order to get those connecting streets that are really very congested to, those are the projects we can actually finish. The, the larger ones take so much money that it'll be forever before we ever have any huge impact on them. So that's just my thought. Director Pfeiffer. So I think the excitement is 
is the fact that we have local this the subregion is going to be a local control discussion anyways being 80 20 or 70 30 does not uh, diminish our abilities to work collaboratively within our region and subregions it's the dollar amount that we're now debating which I have a hard time because it's 80 20 or 70 30 the point is regardless of the number we have an ability to put it to a subregion and make decisions on projects that will not have to compete against other subregions, which benefits us. But when I look at the subregion, and I'm looking at what we're debating here, it's debating if I get an extra two million in my county or not. And what can two million dollars do in my county? Nothing really. I, seriously, I mean, I'm thinking of all the projects and the visions. I might get some more bike ped, and that's going to be a whole nother discussion, I'm sure, at this table. But I can't get my Ward Road grade separation. I'm not going to get my Kipling ex uh, inter interchange uh, done. Um, I'm not going to get my grade separation on 72. Those I just named there is already $80 million. So even if I talk to anything, well, probably more with the, the I-70 Kipling, but if I try to talk to my subregion about the Ward grade separation with the railroad, I mean, what are we sitting at? $25 million. I think Wheat Ridge is here. But it's $25, $30 million. Not even my subregion can cover that. So when I look at the $2 million that we're debating, why not just put it in the regional pot and, and make that significant project a reality instead of worrying about, um, I'm going to get an extra bike ped for that time when I could just contribute it to the regional pot? Director Rakowski. Call the question, Mr. Chair. Have a motion to call the question. Have a motion and a second to call the question. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Yeah. Call for a division of the House. Okay. For, for the motion to call. Okay, on the motion to call, we just need two thirds, a supermajority, which we have. Um, so we have the question called. We have a motion by Director Teal. Second by Director Vidum for the 80-20 split, 80 for subregional, 20 for regional. Uh, because of the conversation and the previous straw poll, I'm sure we need a show of hands. So if you want your vote counted, please raise your hand and leave it raised. So we're voting. Uh, raise your hand if you are in favor of the 80-20 split. And those opposed? Wow. So we have uh, 22 ayes and 20 nays. So the motion passes for 80-20 split regional, sub-regional. Thank you very much. Appreciate all the conversation. And um, we will move on to our next agenda item. The next agenda item is agenda item 12, which is, uh, excuse me, that's what we just did. Let's not do that again. The next, <laughs> the next agenda item is, a, let, let's, let, the next agenda item is agenda item 13, which is uh, Rich Morrow, who is going to talk to us about state legislative issues. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I think that takes us to attachment F and page 59. Uh, the first thing, we actually have two oh. items. The first thing we need to do is I need to ask for the board to adopt, officially adopt the uh, 2018 state legislative policy statement, which I hope will be an easier motion um, than the last one. Um, and uh, then after, uh, after you do that, uh, we'll discuss the uh, legis state legislative session and the uh, handful of bills that have been inter introduced in the last week. So I guess at this point, uh, unless if there are questions on the state legislative policy statement, which we presented to the board last December at your board, board meeting and asked for comments back and we did not receive any comments, so I would ask uh, for a motion 
uh, on that unless there are other questions. Director Atchison. Mr. Chairman, I would move to approve the 2018 policy statement on state legislative issues. Okay. Have a motion and a second. Discussion. Seeing none, all those in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Thank you. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Morrow. All right. The next section then is the uh, state uh, legislative session. And if I might, I wanted to take uh, ju uh, just a, a couple of minutes before we get into the bills and introduce you to our lobbyists and, and um, ask them to come up and give a brief, brief pre preview of the session and uh, some relatively new information about the, the state budget and revenue picture. So uh, with that, uh, I think they're getting their microphone set up for uh, Ed Bowditch and Jennifer Castle. Thank you. Thank you all. Good evening. I'm Jennifer Castle. Um, just to give a quick legis legislative update, Ed's going to give a little bit of a budget preview as well, too. So the legislature convened um, last Wednesday. Um, the first couple of days of session, we saw a lot of speeches given by the majority leaders. And then, of course, the governor's state of the state was on Thursday. Um, most of the speeches, as you would imagine, echoed a lot of bipartisan um, work, um, trying to get a lot of things done. They've got a lot on their plate, et cetera, et cetera. So it was um, the first couple of days were very cheerful and, you know, a big kumbaya, if you will. So far, we've seen 179 bills introduced to date. Um, we'll stop seeing some bills probably the end of this week, early next week. Um, total, we'll probably see anywhere from 600 to 700 bills introduced this session. Generally, the first couple of bills that are introduced in each chamber give us somewhat of an idea of what legislative leadership's priorities are going to be for the, for the session. So, so far, based on what bills have been introduced, we're going to see a focus on broadband, transportation, rural teacher recruitment, um, the governor's energy office, um, and affordable housing. Um, Big ticket items that are also going to be discussed this legislative session, PARA, the state budget, of course, transportation funding as well, too, as well as affordable housing. Um, we do expect this session to be quite partisan, um, given that it is an election year, also because it is a, we have a gubernatorial election in 2018. We have seven members of the General Assembly who are running for higher office as well, too. So we, will, so we do expect it to be very partisan. We will have a lot of messaging bills as well, too, some of which have already been introduced. Um, but Ed and I still remain positive. Um, we do think that the legislature will get a lot of things done this, this legislative session. And I'm not being sarcastic. Um, we do think that they'll actually get some work done. So we're optimistic. Yes, thank you. And again, I'm Ed Bowditch. And thank you for the privilege of mm -hmm. uh, allowing us to continue to represent Dr. Cog. A couple of key budget items in the last few weeks. Um, the December 20th revenue estimates were issued right before the, uh, during the holidays, and Colorado continues to have very strong economic growth, especially in the Dr. Cogger in the metro area. Uh, one of the consequences of the strong housing market is that the legislative economists predict a further decrease in the residential assessment rate. At this point, they think it will decrease in 2019 from the current 7.2 percent down to 6.11 percent. So for any of you that have a property tax um, base in your jurisdictions, that would be a huge decrease. This is on top of the decrease that was just enacted um, in 2017. Now those numbers can change, but the legislative economists continue to see very strong um, residential real estate growth. Um, in terms of the, the general fund revenue, the key issue on December 20th, that was the day that the federal government passed the Tax Cuts and Job Act. Um, the Colorado economists forecast strong increases in Colorado's general fund due to our strong economy, but also due to the changes at the federal tax level. As many of you have probably heard, Colorado is one of seven states that links our taxable income to federal taxable income. The changes they made at the federal level to um, broaden the base and decrease some of their rates in effect, we will recognize they're broadening the base. They have decreased some of their exemptions and deductions. We will just continue to recognize federal taxable income. So it's going to be a strong revenue growth for the next few years. 
It's very difficult to predict exactly what's going to happen next with that. Um, the governor has requested for some of these additional funds for one-time money. This year, the governor has requested moving $148 million into the state highway fund. The governor then said, let's wait until the March revenue estimates come out, and that's the key revenue estimate to balance the state budget for the next year. But based on the March revenue estimates, if there is room, the governor's office recommends moving the state reserve from 6.5% to 10% over a period of years, then taking of the extra additional revenue beyond that. One third would go to education. The other two thirds would go to infrastructure. And of that other two thirds, 75% to the state highway fund and 25% to other priorities. These will be key discussions going on at the legislature this year. Uh, typically, the legislative joint budget committee um, is the one driving a lot of these conversations, but I think leadership will also be involved in setting these broad priorities. Thank you, Rich. Questions or comments? Yes, Director Champion. Thank you. Um, you said $148 million to uh, transportation. And then you went on to discuss percentage, percentage figures. Does that, is that included in that $148 million, or is that in addition uh, for infrastructure, yeah. bridges? Um, th Pardon? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> th thank you, and I, I, I'm sorry if I wasn't clear enough. The $148 million is a transfer for this year, the 17-18 budget. Okay. And the additional revenue would be for 18-19 and in the future. Thank you. Yeah, and I didn't make that clear. Thank you for clarifying that. Director, Director Daigle. So 18, 19, and 20, then the additional revenue wouldn't ever get to those entities until a year after that. So you say 18, 19, 20, if there's additional revenue, schools won't get it until 19, 20, 21? Because um, that's are, kind of how it works? Well, no, there are additional components for K-12 education. So, for example, in the governor's um, January 1st budget request, based in part on some of these additional revenues, the governor proposed an additional $30 million for, for K-12 for next fiscal year, fiscal year 2018-19. Okay. And, and so there's some of that, but I didn't get into all the K-12 ramifications. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Other questions or comments? <laughs> thank you very much. Mr. Morrow. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. And so you should all have in front of you a handout that looks like this, a matrix of bills. Uh, it was emailed to all of you yesterday morning. And um, just to remind you, the reason why it was not mailed with the board packet was that the, the legislature convened the day the board packet went out. And so we didn't have any bills until the next day. And so this uh, and then, of course, uh, Monday uh, was a holiday, so the first day we could get any bills to you really was uh, Tuesday morning. So apologize for that, but uh, in, the, in the future, uh, we will have uh, in, in your board packet two of these. One will be an update on bills you've taken a position on, and the second one will be like this, new bills with staff uh, recommended positions. So I would ask at this point if you would like me to go through each bill, uh, or do you want to, or do you feel ready to, to start voting on bills? Or how much detail do you, or time do you want me to spend on these bills? Recognizing that I know you ha you haven't had them very for very long. Rick, can we take these just quickly one at a time? We can do that, please. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the, f the very first one on page one um, relates to a proposal to restrict the Department of Health to uh, fee increases on assisted living residences, which they use to fund their implementation of, of regulations on, on the assisted living and on uh, surveys and uh, inspections of these facilities, uh, to restrict the, their, the fees that they charge to simply uh, inflation, the rate of inflation. Um, the, uh, there, the argument that the proponents are making is that th this is the case in law for other types of long-term care facilities like nursing homes. 
uh, but uh, the department and others are, and Dr. Cog in particular, and we have some of our staff here who um, might be jumping out of their seats to speak, but uh, the, the, uh, our aging staff in particular are concerned about limiting those fee increases at this particular time for a number of reasons, including that um, the state does not have another funding source for oversight of assisted living like they do with nursing homes, which get fed, they also get federal funds for those. State funding is the only source uh, for, uh, when it comes to assisted living. And also the uh, 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 state uh, stakeholder group that has included the uh, ombudsman, in fact, Dr. Cog's long-term care ombudsman supervisor has chaired this stakeholder group that has include, included a lot of um, industry uh, members as just completing a, a complete rewrite and update of uh, regulations that will require the st department to have more resources to implement those and to actually uh, make them work. Um, and it and uh, and I think, as I understand it, there there was also discussion in that stakeholder group of increasing fees, initially anyway, to enable the state to have the resources to work on these resolutions. So at this point, uh, our staff has felt very strongly that the board should should oppose this bill. We've gotten information from the department that they are working uh, and meeting with the proponents of this legislation to see if they can come to some kind of compromise. Um, they didn't go into any detail, but I'm assuming that it has something to do with allowing the department to charge some additional fees initially and then kick in the, the inf inflation limitation later. Um, but, um, and, and so we could come back to you if there's a compromise on that with a request to change the position. But for right now, uh, our staff feels very strongly that Dr. Cox should, should oppose this bill. So on Senate Bill 18054, the staff yes. recommendation is to oppose. Can I have a motion, please? Have a motion and a second. Discussion? All those in favor of opposition? Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Point, point of order, Mr. Chair. Excuse me. I'm, I'm sorry. On these, our board hasn't necessarily taken a position on everything, so I'll be abstaining on a number of things, and I abstain on that vote. Say it again. I'm sorry. I'm abstaining on oh, that vote. During this Thank section, you. there are a Thank number you. of yes. things our board hasn't yes. taken a position on. I, I should have uh, mentioned that. Thank you. Okay. Um, the next bill, uh, actually, I've got a typo on it. It says HB001. It should be Senate Bill 001. I proofed that like 12 times and missed that. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and I would imagine this might be one that, that several of you, you in here would have even more comments than I do, but um, this is, uh, as Jennifer mentioned, uh, uh, sometimes the early bills that get introduced give an indication of uh, leadership priorities, and so with this being Senate Bill 1, I think you get an indication on that. Um, you also, I think, will remember that last year the board strongly supported House Bill 1242, which took a somewhat different approach than this bill. Um, rather, uh, I'm asking uh, or recommending that the board monitor this bill for the time being, recognizing that um, it's a fluid situation that we've, we've heard, and, and our lobbyists may want to comment, but we've heard that there may be uh, another bill coming out of the House similar to this. There could be a, a bill or maybe a couple of bills coming out of the House. Um, there could be negotiations between the House and the Senate. So um, we certainly expect to have more to report to you next month. And it seemed prudent at this time, uh, even though this, this bill doesn't go anywhere close to the bill that the board supported last session, uh, that we monitor at this time. Director Atchison. Just following up with staff, um, for some of you, I spend an inordinate amount of time on transportation projects down at the Capitol, and Jennifer and Ed and I almost have a camp down there. But here's something I ask you to consider in this one, and I'm recommending the staff recommendation of monitoring, and here's why. Senate Bill 1, coming out of the Senate, it has no revenue. It has no taxing. This is act exact opposite of what we were proposing uh, last year with 1242. The Senate ended up killing that bill because they didn't want a tax. The House supported a tax. Now, regardless of the amount, that's, that's moot. 
But then the Senate brought back 267 in the last two weeks of the session. This bill, SB uh, House Senate Bill 1, would actually reverse 267. Because of where this is at, and uh, in my conversations with at least three different sets of lobbyists, all working down in there that I work with on a regular basis, the House will not pass this bill because it doesn't have a tax. The Senate will not pass the one that's going to come from the House because it's going to propose a tax. These two, I believe, in my opinion, will end up dying. I don't think we need to expend a bunch of uh, political capital taking a position other than just sit here and watch the two of them flail back and forth with each other for a while because nothing significant is going to come out of SB1 nor what's currently being put together by the House. So I'm recommending that the, the body uh, support a, a, a position of monitoring this. I expect several changes, several more bills, as uh, Kath, uh, Jennifer Nemo talked about. I would expect we'd probably see at least 10 different versions of transportation bills in the, in the House and Senate combined before we're halfway through the session because everybody is saying transportation is number one. Well, we've heard that for five years. It's still not number one. And transportation dollars, the governor has proposed to change the budget. We don't know what's going to happen on the federal level. There's so many things in flux that to take a position on this other than sit and watch it, it I think would be a mistake on us. Would you like to make that a motion? Yes, please. Monitor. Second. second. I have a motion and a second to monitor. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Abstentions. Okay. Thank you. Um, on the next page, we start with Senate Bill 53, and uh, this is another transportation bill on uh, making wearing a seat belt or not wearing a seat belt a primary offense. It's currently a secondary offense. Um, I've been around long enough that I know that bills like this have come before the leg legislature many times over the years, uh, and they've never been able to get over the hurdle to pass even in those years when we lost some federal safety uh, funds for not doing it. Uh, but uh, And I hadn't seen this, uh, this, this type of bill in, in a number of years, so it was somewhat of a surprise to see it again this year. But um, I am rec recommending, staff is recommending that we su support the bill, uh, again, on the uh, principle that it, it does increase safety. Uh, and I actually got some fact sheets, if you want me to read off of them, <laughs> from uh, uh, proponents uh, indicating that um, I think Colorado is one of 16 states that do not do this, uh, but in the other states that do, there's uh, ample evidence that going to a primary offense uh, has a significant uh, effect in reducing uh, traffic-related uh, deaths and certainly uh, the uh, unconstrained deaths. Director Brockett. I'll just make a motion that we support this bill. and. Um, just that it ties directly back to the safety things that we were talking about before. If we're going to hit those targets for lowered fatalities on our roads, this is the kind of thing we need. Second. I have a motion and a second. Discussion? All those in favor of support on this bill? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next, several, next few bills here are... Um, uh, housing related uh, it might be the first time I've had a matrix that had way more housing bills than transportation or aging bills but that may change as the session goes on although we are expecting a number of other uh, affordable housing and renters protections types of bills um, again I think as Ed and Jen mentioned um, maybe not all that surprising as as the cost of housing and the availability of affordable housing has become uh, a much bigger issue in recent years. Um, so with that, the, uh, the first bill um, I, is uh, proposing to a uh, 25 cent tax on uh, plastic bags to put into a fund to, uh, to pay for uh, affordable housing programs within the, the state department of, uh, of local affairs, the Division of Housing. Um, re again, recognizing that I, I think this is, 
uh, it's been somewhat of a controversial issue even in local governments, I decided not to make a recommendation and just ask the board uh, for your direction on this particular one. House Bill 1054, uh, Director Atchison. My question on this one is, the way the bill is set up, there's a monitoring piece that the customer has to be able to say that they're enrolled in the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. How do we verify <coughs> that? Because I don't know of any kind of I, yeah, and, and They do? And, okay. Yeah, and the state. I don't use it. The state would have that okay. information. Because so we're talking about food stamps. It's food stamps okay. is what that All right. is. Yeah. So that's where I'm. My wife never lets me go to a grocery store. <laughs> it's a good reason. Ever. And I'm just as happy not going. Director, but I thank you for the clarification. Director Baker, did you have your hand up? Uh oh, I apologize. I thought. Oh, Director Shaw, excuse me. Okay. Oh, <laughs> I'm Direct sorry. I should have put food stamps in parentheses. Director Zabel. So this would be a statewide? Yes. Yes. Okay, yes. so what happens if certain jurisdictions already had a fee on there? Would this up that fee? That is a good question. I'd have to go back and look at the bill again and see. Uh, how it deals with that. My guess is it, is it would grandfather those, but I don't want to say that without looking at the bill. Hello. I think, Mr. Chairman, I think That's several mountain question. communities have already put this yeah, tax on. Yeah, there are a few communities yeah, that already have around. these. Right. Director right. Brockett. Is there an estimate of the amount of revenue this would raise? No, the fiscal note has not come out yet, and that's that's why the uh, that f this is a new column we put in here. We're going to try to put fiscal notes so that if you got it electronically, you can actually click on the bill and the uh, fiscal note uh, in your electronic version, and it will take you right to it. So, um, But, no, these are too new. They ha don't have fiscal notes on them yet, unfortunately. So, I mean, we could, if you want, we could monitor it until next, next month, until we get more information, come Dur back. Director Rakowski. To answer what, Director Sabo's uh, question, I think it to some degree depends on Article 20 of the Constitution. If you're a home rule area, then it could remain. But if you're statutory, then I think it's overridden. That may very well be the case. No. Director Christman. I would ask that you just monitor this. Uh, Herb, I actually do a lot of grocery shopping, so I make up for all of yours that you don't do. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. And, uh, what concerns me about this is uh, that I think it unfairly targets some of the people who are least able to pay it. Um, I, you know, I shop at Whole Foods, okay, and they don't have plastic bags. They have, I either bring my own or they give me a paper bag. So at the higher end grocery stores, you're not going to be paying this tax at the lower end stores you would and I just think that's not right the concept might be good but the implementation is wrong would you like to make that a motion I'd like to move that we just monitor this like have a motion and a second discussion okay. director yeah, Pack. I just have a question um, is this tax going to be just on the people who use the plastic bags or on everybody who shops I, th I, I believe it's only if you uh, take take the bag. Take the plastic the, bag. Take the bag. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Hold on. Hold on. Hey, hold on. Oh, hold on. Okay. Director Daigle. And my question would be: Is it per bag or is it per, per shopping event? Because if you have a large family like I did at one time, um, this bag. Uh, the yeah. The, well, the store would count them as they go, I would imagine, but I would imagine that it's just a one-time 25 cent or whatever. It just brings it back. Can you? It's every time you shop okay. for every bag. So that's another so question, I think. the bags? That's another question I think would ask uh, to be okay. investigated. Director Zabel. Yeah, that's what my question. Okay. It doesn't sound like this is ready for prime time. Mm -hmm. Right. This bill says there are so many questions. So we have a motion and a second to monitor. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Abstain. Okay. And, uh, Rich, obviously you heard that there's a number of things that yep. people want to we'll hear. Get, we'll get some questions answered for you. You bet. Okay.
Okay. Uh, the next bill is uh, another one, uh, affordable housing bill. Um, and again, I, I think I mentioned in the staff comments, one of the things we're, we see a lot is uh, efforts by legislators to find funding sources because part of the problem too is that there just isn't a lot of money uh, or independent funding sources uh, for ha affordable housing programs. So like on this one, proposing a uh, surcharge on uh, the recording of um, documents in uh, uh, purchase or uh, the housing, uh, what is it here, the, uh, it's a document fee and on the uh, transactions is what the word I'm trying to say. And that, fu that funding it would actually go to um, the uh, Colorado Housing and Finance Authority uh, in order to uh, fund the different programs, affordable housing programs that they, that they have. And I don't know if you guys can explain that better than I'm doing <laughs> or not. Um, the only other thing I wanted to add to Rich's comments would be is that this bill is a may. Um, it allows counties the options to opt in to this, to, to do it. They, don't, they're, they are not forced to do it. It would be at their discretion. That's a good point. That's, yep. that's yep. a good and then, and then of the $5 for the document, document fee, $4 would go straight into this affordable housing yeah. fund. $1 goes for administrative costs to the clerks. So Director Zabel and then Director Partridge. Um, so my question is, um, have the clerks weighed in on it, and what do they say? I don't believe they have as of yet. Okay, I can probably guess what they're going to say. I, I can tell you the, the realtors are opposed. <laughs> of course they are. As are the counties. I what, what did the clerks say last year? I bet they haven't changed because this was ran last year. CCI might not be, but that doesn't mean counties. There's multiple county organizations. Yes, you are and, correct. And so. CCI hasn't had its, I mean, if, I don't know what they're doing now, but they, are, they haven't had their policy committees yet. And t they're meeting next week. I think so we opposed it last year because there was some very well kind of nonsense like this going on last year too. Um, also, the the money that is collected, if we may, <laughs> if we may um, collect the extra four dollars, is does that come back into the county of those taxpayers that paid it for affordable housing, or does it just get slewn wherever that institution says it should go? It goes to Aurora. <laughs> then I'm then I'm a no. <laughs> Even if it did, I might be a no anyway. But right. do we know that? I don't do, know. I, okay. uh, Jennifer, do you? Director Zabo, um, that is the intention of the bill: is that the the monies generated from that county will be spent in that county. Okay. Director Jones. Well, I guess given that we have a, an affordable housing crisis certainly around the metro area and I would say far beyond in much of the state that's growing um, and this creates a permissive opportunity to generate funds for affordable housing I would recommend that we support it I think it's in keeping with our metro vision goals around you know, housing opportunity is that a motion it is we have a motion and a second I know director champion would like to chime in yes I would the way this is written indicates to me that it's a five dollars per document per page no. on a recording no, I don't think it's per page I, I just want to make sure that it isn't I believe it is just for the document correct and if it's a I mean I've I've recorded a lot of stuff <laughs> and I want to make sure it, it's not it's it's per transaction correct correct that's our understanding Please confirm that. We will. Other? Yeah. Director well, Grossman. Per, per document, not per page. Yeah, per yeah. document. Right. No. It's supposed to be out, is it early next week? There's a call. It, yep, it's still not quite out. Yeah. Director Atchison. Yeah, the one thing I did notice in this, this only applies to those people who are at 80% of AMI. If you are less than 80% in the 30, 40, 50, or 60, it doesn't apply for you to being able to get those funds back. It's only one particular category. So that's, to me, that's the problem because it, it selects one group that is trying to get into workforce housing that is at the upper end of that group, not the ones that are in the middle or at the bottom side. So 
I don't see where it's doing that much to help us in real workforce housing because you're taking the higher paying ones and helping them. Uh, Director Atchison, I would just clarify too that it says um, not at least 25 percent of the money would be used on households at 80 percent. Mm -hmm. So, so there could be money left okay. over for other categories. Have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? What's the motion? To support. Oh, I to support. To support. Excuse me. Yes. Uh, all those in favor of support. Aye. Opposed? Aye. No. Okay. Let's do a hand vote. All those in favor of support, please raise your hand. The motion fails. Do we have another motion? Or should I just put it as monitor? No. Do, do you want to make another motion? Yeah, if somebody would like to make another motion, we certainly can. <laughs> Direct order, Graves. Mr. Chairman. Director Graves. Point of order. I think it's important to call the yes, no, and abstention votes for each vote, oh, yes. even That's if the motion right. fails there. And just following Director Stoltzman's lead, I yep. do wish to record an abstention for all votes this evening. That's, Thank you. That's a very good point. So uh, we had the, we had the uh, support. Let's do the opposed. Those who want to oppose this. Abstained. So okay. if I might, what, what they're discussing, probably should have mentioned this at the beginning, because we have, uh, uh, I think, a, a number of new members, is that board policy on uh, positions on legislative issues requires a two-thirds vote either way of those present and voting. So those of you who abstain are abstaining and are not counted at all. So Connie's keeping track of those who voted yes and those who voted no and seeing if we had a two-third either way. And we didn't have a two-third we, we, yeah, we, either way, right? As long as the number of people voting adds up to our form. Yeah. Yeah, no, we, we certainly do not have a two-thirds vote. Uh, Director Brockett. Well, I'll move that we take a monitor position on this and ask for more details to be brought back at a future meeting. Second. Have a motion and a second for monitor discussion. All those in favor of a position of monitor, say aye. aye. Opposed? Aye. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you. All right. I think, are we on the last one? Last two? No? Last We've three. Got three more. I'm sorry it's taken longer than we thought. Okay. Um, it'll be short. It'll be better hopefully next month. Um, uh, Senate right. Bill 7. This one ought to be easy. There's bipartisan sponsorship in both houses. It's just extending an existing tax credit for five years. How easy is that? <laughs> we we'll have a motion to support. Second. Motion and a second to support. Discussion? All those in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Abstentions? Okay. A couple of the three. Okay. The next bill, Senate Bill 10 comes under the category of uh, uh, renters protections and um, both if you look at it from uh, the perspective of our policies in MetroVision and certainly the experiences uh, in with our aging staff um, we've seen a, a lot of uh, concerns and issues lately uh, with renters and, and obviously a lot of older adults on fixed incomes uh, are rent and uh, have very have difficulties if they can't stay where they are at roughly the same rent there's not much other place where they can go and so uh, there we're actually expecting a few more bills to come this session trying to uh, put in provisions that make it a little bit easier uh, for those who are renting to, to stay in in their uh, places in their apartments and so what this bill does is um, 
two things. It says under current statute, there, there's nothing in law that requires a landlord, and I don't know if anybody here is a landlord, but there's nothing in law that says that a landlord must give a copy of the lease to the renter, or even if renter, and, and I, this happens, if people pay their rent in cash, there's nothing that says the landlord has to give you a, a receipt for that payment. And so I don't rent, so I, you know, I don't have personal experience with this, but um, I've heard stories that, that there, there have been problems where, where um, there have been disputes and uh, the renters are at a disadvantage and sometimes end up losing uh, their apartment. And so what this bill basically just does is says if the renter requests a copy of the lease or re if the renter requests a receipt for a cash payment that the landlord must give them a copy of the, re of the receipt or lease. Director Atchison. Just a couple of things to, to go along with this one. Uh, I know Beth is one of the sponsors out of uh, Thornton on this. However, this in my opinion is the start of this bill. I'm expecting a couple of amendments and uh, one of the things I would tell you that is being proposed is that it will require landlords to provide leases in multiple languages. Here's one of the things that Westminster has run into. How many people can interpret the legal law in a piece in Hmong? How about in English? Yeah. So this is, this is the kind of thing that we're, we're facing in, in my city is we've been requested to pass an ordinance to require all landlords to, re, to provide leases in multiple languages. But we haven't found firms that can both interpret the language and provide legal guidance for that language. That is not what's in this current piece, but I'm expecting more of that to come, so I want to ask that you consider monitoring this till we get the rest of the pieces to, to come into this because it is going to get to be a big deal. If you are a multifamily company that provides leasing properties, many of those have multiple versions of leases. They don't all use the same lease on every piece of property. So trying to interpret those into multiple languages and then you've got to decide what languages are you going to provide those in and who owns the responsibility if it's legally inaccurate when it's translated. We haven't found anybody who's willing to take that role because of the fact that most people who translate are not attorneys. Or attorneys that can translate don't do this kind of work. So it's, it's a big issue for Westminster right now. We are still trying to figure a way to get through it. But I can't support something that I think is not finished. I think there's more pieces coming to it. As, as Rick talked about, there are going to be a number of these coming yet, and I would recommend that we do a, a monitor for this one. Is that a motion? Yes. I have a motion and a second. Director Odoricio. Um, I, I appreciate the concern that this could turn into a slippery slope with other changes moving down um, in time, but at, as it's written right now, it's a pretty reasonable ask. And right now, people all across this state are being taken advantage of because they don't have the simple uh, proof to show that they've made payments or a general understanding of the agreement that they signed. And at this point, as it's written, uh, upon request, we should have people be able to have access to show that they made a payment and that they show uh, that they signed certain documents. And in, to be honest with you, it protects the landlords just as much as it does the residents. This is a transparency thing. I recommend, as it's written, that we would support it for those reasons. And if it comes to an issue of a, either an amendment or something else about language, then we could talk about whether uh, that makes sense. And um, that's my recommendation. Is So I would ask that we vote no on monitoring, follow up with a motion to support. Director Zabel. My question is, in all this, you know, previous bills with the affordable housing and everything, and and every you know dollars they're trying to gather up for more affordable housing and that like seems to be the buzzword of of anything we talk about today if we require a landlord to have to probably see a lawyer to get his contract put into monger monger whatever spanish chinese japanese all these different languages 
that is very, very costly. It's not in the bill. So you take a rent. The, the landlord will not eat that cost. He will pass that cost on to the tenant. And therefore, we're undoing all the affordable housing stuff by, by making these regulations. I agree they should have a, a contract and a receipt. But to require him to do that instead of your rent now being 1100 it could be 1400 and that would put a lot of disparity on a lot of people. And that, that's just my concern with these type of regulations. They're definitely passed through. And if they have to give it in English and they've been doing it in English for 20 years and they have to make a few copies, that's one thing. But have to do it in every kind of different language, I think it's just going to up the price of housing. So I have Director Jones, Teal, Pfeiffer, and Peck. Director Jones. So I find myself agreeing with Dec and Director Odorizio. We have lobbyists. That's why we pay them. If we believe with the basic premise of the bill as introduced, and then we should adopt a position of support and ask them to lobby to make sure that it passes in a similar form to it, the way it's been introduced so that the fears that are being articulated at the end of the table don't actually get materialized. But the bill is introduced, doesn't have any of that stuff in it. That's why we have lobbyists to lobby on those things. So mm -hmm. I, I agree having a, a, a lease agreement and receipt of payment is just basic uh, business practice. It does protect the landlord. It protects the tenant. It's a, that's just good practice. And so I think we should support the bill and then just ask our lobbyists to make sure it doesn't get out of hand in some way. Direct, Director Teal. Well, I, I do agree with uh, Director Odoricio. Uh, uh, at face value, I do think this is perfectly reasonable. I'm going to take the opportunity to once again agree with Director Jones Whoa. that indeed this is good business practice and perfectly reasonable. But I've. But there's more. However. <laughs> But I've watched uh, Herb make predictions about bills uh, too many times over the last three years that turned out to be correct. So I would support the motion to monitor. Director Peck. I'm looking at the flip side of this bill, which I think we, which is why I think we should support it. We have people now signing leases that have no idea what's in them and are really being held to something that is a bit illegal. Uh, when they don't understand the language. So this is a good first step, and I think we should support it. Okay, so we have a motion uh, and a second to monitor this. Further discussion? All those in favor of monitor? Aye. Aye. The see hands, please. I'm sorry. Opposed? So that motion fails. Abstentions, I'm sorry, abstentions, thank you. Okay. So the motion to monitor fails. Director Odoricio. I move uh, that we support this bill as written. Second. Motion and a second to support. Discussion. Director Teal. Um, okay, I'll go ahead and support this. But because you said as written, and I would ask that um, direction be given to our lobbyists mm -hmm. that our support as written is there, but it, it should be, it should come back to us next Excellent. month as we go through the session, yep. and we do, of course, hold the opportunity to oppose. Yes. Yeah. Staff, your lobbyists hear, hear you loud and clear. Further discussion? Uh, show of hands, all those in favor of a position of support. Opposed? And abstentions. Thank you. The motion passes. Thank you. All right, the last one I'll make easy on you. Yeah, um, <laughs> just asking to monitor the bill. Uh, this, isn't, this is another one sort of maybe along those same lines that gets into um, 
not having landlords, I guess, dig into your criminal record if it's one that you were um, charged but not found guilty or there was sealed records and so forth and it's kind of confusing anyway and I figure pretty controversial anyway so I'm at this point I'm just asking that you that you monitor it unless somebody has a better idea move to support motion to support is there a second second motion and a second discussion Yes. Excuse me. To, to support the staff recommendation. Support the staff recommendation there you is go. what I meant. Okay. Whew. <laughs> Look at the time. Let's start another conversation. Okay. Uh, discussion on the issue. All those in favor of the position to monitor, please raise your hand. Okay. Uh, Opposed? Abstentions. Thank you very much. It passes. Whew. Thank you very much. Rich, thank we're, you. We're going to have some fun. <laughs> yeah, All right, we've got a couple more items. Um, informational briefing, agenda item 15, Mr. Pot, Spots, excuse me. Good evening. How are you all? Thanks for sticking around for the Late Late Show. <laughs> um, we're going to talk briefly about the 2016 annual report on traffic congestion. You all should have a copy of this in front of you. It's something that Dr. Cog does every year, um, and we cover a lot of topics. Um, one of the main things we monitor is vehicle miles of travel in the region. We generally measure congestion. And then this year, we've taken a special topic to look at the impacts of crashes on traffic congestion in the region. So maintaining a congestion database is something we're federally required to do. It's something I sit in my cubicle clicking around a lot and talking to other people, gathering data. We get traffic volumes, and then we use those volumes and other speed data we gather to estimate on every roadway in the regional roadway system, the operating speeds, travel time, delay. We give every single roadway segment a grade amongst a bunch of other measures. Um, typically, these results have been used for the regional transportation plan and evaluating projects in the transportation improvement program. So you've seen a lot of maps tonight. This is the regional roadway system. We, these are the segments that we um, grade. So as I've said, we, um, in this report you will find the regional VMT change, various system performance measures, the key congested locations, which we'll highlight in a map, and like I said, the special topic we're covering. Another thing that's happening these days is with the FAST Act, the new federal transportation bill, we're going to be reporting performance measure, measures and this is going to be a big source for a lot of those con congestion performance measures. This also helps us coordinate with all our regional partners, CDOT, RTD, and local governments. So the kind of the big story this year is um, our VMT is going up again. Um, every day in the Dr. Cog region, um, there's over 80 million vehicle miles traveled. Um, that's about a, over 120 person miles traveled in vehicles, buses, bikes. Um, so this, the history of this is from 2000 to 2006, we saw a pretty steady increase. From 2007 to 2011 or so, there was a pretty stable no growth. And as a result of that, VMT per capita was decreasing. That's a Metro Vision goal for us. This year, Dr. Cog is estimating that every day there's about 3.5% more VMT than last year. It's a really big raw growth in jump. It's a really big number, an increase in, in VMT. Um, you can see the recent trend. We went from kind of a flat line to the last five years of a pretty ste steady and, and growing increase every year. And so what that's done is instead of while our VMT is growing rapidly, our population while also going rapidly is not growing as fast. So while we saw our VMT per capita decrease for a long period, kind of stay steady, over the last two years we've actually seen a relatively significant increase in that VMT per capita. So to remind you all the MetroVision target for VMT per capita is 23. We're heading in the wrong direction a little bit right there. Um, so why is that happening? You know, what we, we do is we really just keep our fingers on the pulse of this thing. We're not really diagnosing, but from, from our professional experience, we're, we're, you know, we're seeing a booming economy. The economy does affect um, the, how, the amount of driving people do. Fuel costs, after being $4 plus for a while there, have been relatively low and stable for the last several years. And the, one of the main contributors, and will continue to be a main contributor, moving into our horizon year of 2040, is our population is growing significantly. 
Um, so just talk briefly about measuring congestion in the region and what we do for that. Um, this is not like a, a level of service engineering analysis. We're doing kind of high level regional planning. But we do kind of look at it in a, in a unique way. Um, we look at it from five different um, characteristics. We look at the duration on every segment. So how long does that congestion last? Is it just an hour a day or is it four hours during the day? How severe is it? The magnitude is how um, on a freeway that's carrying 120,000 people, are all those people being affected versus an arterial that's only carrying 3,000 people a day? And the variation, so how severe, how bad is that um, congestion compared to an off-peak period? And then the, the last thing we look at, which kind of is a little bit separate, but it's the reliability. So we look at how many crashes are happening on these segments. So there is such thing as reliable congestion. If you go on I-25 at 5 o'clock, it's going to be congested. However, if there's a crash on any segment, it's going to make things a lot worse, right? After we go through those, we give each segment a score from 0 to 4. We total those scores up, and we give each segment a grade, um, A, B, C, D, or F. D and F are typically the ones we call severely congested. The new exciting thing this year that we're integrating into the congestion database is INRIX data. So INRIX data uses smartphones or GPS units. Billions and billions of data sources are all gathered into one source, and they collect speed on segments 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Historically, what we've done is kind of calculate that speed. So we look at volume and capacity, this whole calculation thing. Now for freeways, we are using this INRIX data, and we're integrating that into our databases. Um, and we get this for free through CDOT, from CDOT, which is just great. Thanks, CDOT. Um, so unfortunately, we do not, we're just not quite reliable yet for arterial roadways, only for freeways. So that's what we're using it for in freeways. Arterials are still the old delay um, calculations. Um, another thing about INRIX is, it, like I said earlier, it's going to be used for performance measures. We're planning on partnering with CDOT to report um, these performance measures using INRIX data. And the last part of the calculation is we also estimate the congestion in 2040. So the main source of figuring out what, what's going to happen in 2040 is our travel model, something we run anyway. And we kind of apply those speeds and volume changes from the model onto our um, congestion management program um, network. Um, and that does include all the, the projects that are in the regional transportation plan. It includes the changes in demographics. So we're huge growth in population and jobs. Um, and what we found at the end of the day was the new INRIX methodology is actually delay, predicting a little bit less delay in, um, in 2040 than the previous methodology. Um, so just, this is just a couple maps we'll show you just so you can see how much change is happening this is, and where it's happening. So this is the change in households in between 2015 and 2040. The red areas are we're going to anticipating significant growth in households. And same with jobs. Again, the red areas are we're anticipating significant growth in employment. We put all that together into the blender, and we get this map. So the red links are the ones that have scored D or F in the year 2016. So that's a lot of congestion. You've all driven out there, right? Um, and the orange links are the ones that we anticipate additionally being congested by 2040. So the, the pretty map is in your center, is in the center here, if, you, if that's a little blurry for you. But there's a lot of congestion we're anticipating. And we also have this table in here. I'm not going to, do you want to guys want to go through one of these by one way? <laughs> All right. <laughs> we'll just highlight a couple then. So uh, lane miles of roads congested for three hours or more. We're anticipating on doubling, basically, by 2040. Um, you know, everything's going to get significantly more congested per our calculations. The last thing I'll note is um, we do these economic travel, costs of travel delay. This, this, table, this shows. There is a cost to this delay, an economic and personal cost to being stuck in traffic. And we try to monetize that there. Um, briefly, I'll go through impacts of crashes. So there are about 70,000 reported traffic crashes every year in the region. So that's about 200 crashes every single day. Um, as we discussed a lot tonight, the fatalities and serious injuries are by far our biggest concern. After that, you start to see the impacts of these crashes on traffic and causing additional delay. Um, we, there's, there's things we can do to mitigate that, um, but it, we're not going to prevent it entirely. Freeways experience the greatest impact of all these crashes because there is less, uh, there's less ways to get around on the grid. Um, if you're on a freeway, you're kind of stuck there. 
Um, so we do maintain a database of crashes. You've seen our congestion report, or our, excuse me, our crash report before, I believe. Um, but one thing we can do using this INRIX data and, and the decision makers and incident management plans can use the INRIX data for us to examine how a crash um, affects the roadway that it happens on and the surrounding roadways. And I'll give you two, well, this is one crash happened in June 2016 on West I-70 near US-6. Um, and it happened at 4 o'clock. Um, this graph shows three days, the day before the crash, the day after the, the day of the crash, and the day after the crash. So obviously, the day of the crash, speeds went way down. The red is about 10 miles per hour or less. Um, the graph shows westbound traffic and basically showing two things. It's showing how far the traffic backed up. And the, the queue that was caused by this crash went back about five miles. And from left to right is about the, is the duration of that crash. So it took about four hours for this incident to clean out. So you can compare that to a normal day where there's virtually no delay compared to how severely that affected um, this roadway that day. The other thing you can do is look at the surrounding area. Um, so again, on the left is an average day. The day. On the right is the day of the incident. So here's 4.30. This is 10, 30 minutes after the uh, crash. Um, at 5.30, an hour later, you can see how many roadways surrounding that are, are affecting. So you can see C-470 and US-6 are severely impacted by the crash that happened on I-70 as, as traffic gets rerouted um, and more. So 6.30 and then all the way to 7.30, that's the four hours it took to clear out this trash. So again, you know, this is something you can pull up on your smartphone and look at current traffic. INRIX is really good about logging every single minute and going back in time and, and analyzing what happened after an incident, whether it be a snowstorm or a crash like this. Um, and I'll just wrap up quickly and just say that this is our m mantra about avoiding adopting and alleviating traffic, you know. Um, avoid it by working from home or using real-time information. Adapt to it by using alternative modes and alleviate it, which is the work we, we do to improve the, the infrastructure and systems. And with that, I'll take any questions. Comments or questions? Director Shaw. I just had a thought of, of one of the factors that we don't list here, and it could possibly be the lack of um, attainable housing close in as an influence to total vehicle miles traveled per capita because a lot of people are living in Monument or Elizabeth who were not living there before but they're only there because they can afford to buy a home or apartment there. Yeah, absolutely. Other questions or comments? Director Christman. Uh, you indicated that the data shows that it um, Delays are going to go down in 2040. So do we know why? I think it's honestly mostly a change in methodology. Um, it is still something we're examining, um, why it happened. It's a new methodology for us. Um, so the INRIX data is it's, it's just a very different animal than what we were, we were using before. And we've been using that data for a long time, um, the delay the curve methodology. So. I, I, it has more to do with the methodology change and less to do with change that we've affected, I would say. So that may not be accurate. Well, what prediction is really? No, no. Okay. <laughs> it's an it's aspirational the, goal. <laughs> Director Atchison. A uh, question for CDOT. Deborah, the information you're getting off of the cell phones, is that for people who have signed up for a program, or is that something you're monitoring cell phones, period? So the INRIX data actually comes from cell phones. We do not get the information. It's been binned and rolled up for us, so we don't get details. Does that make sense? So that's the source of their data. They have, um, I forget, there's another company called HERE, and each of them work with a different telephone provider. And you might be talking about sometimes we do Bluetooth. We do testing ourselves to see how long it's taking, and we'll do something off of Bluetooth readers, but that's like our own people. So as you're asking? Director Pfeiffer. Well, I, I'll just tell everyone, being the technologist, uh, if you use Waze or anything, they're tracking everything you're doing anyways. And if you look in your phone, no matter if you're not using Waze, deep down in your phone, it says that Android or Apple is going to track your speed where you are and where have you been, they're doing it anyways without you possibly even knowing. And that's, you know, 
You worry about big government learning things. They know a lot more about you. And sometimes Google will send you a map of where you've been all month. Have well, you that's seen that? Freaky. So, <laughs> so the data's out there. It's just who owns the data. Yes. And, and unfortunately, even when people ask for that data to see what it looks like and so we can make, take data, make action and improvements, um, even government can't know details. It's always a blended pool. But yet those companies, Android, Apple, they know everything about you. Um, so just keep that in mind. If you go look in your app, it'll say they're tracking even your speed. But you've got to go deep into the OS to look for it. Just thought. Well, thanks for that nice note. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Other uh, questions or comments for Mr. Spots? Yes, Director Walton. I was Walton. wondering where we could um, view this presentation. The presentation itself or the report? The report's got most of the good stuff on it. It's on our website. Um, the presentation will be with the board packet. It'll be posted on the web tomorrow. Okay. Okay, very good. This is an informational briefing. There's no action necessary. Thank you very much. Next are committee reports. Uh, so we'll start with uh, Director Jones on the stack. Um, the stack has not yet met in 2018, and I reported on the December meeting back in December, so we're Very good to good. go. Director Atchison, Metro Mayors. Uh, two items. One, this past Saturday, Metro Mayors had their annual retreat. The primary part of that retreat was to talk about a petition ballot issue for transportation. The partnerships being led through the Denver Metro Chamber and the stakeholders in that presented a proposal to the Metro Mayors. Metro Mayors is preparing a document to go back to them with some questions and our recommendations. That letter is now out to all of the mayors. So I would ask you please to go back, make sure your mayors on behalf of your uh, municipalities are responding to that. They only have until next Monday to respond. Uh, there is an executive committee meeting tomorrow, uh, be the first one for the year, and part of that will be a continued discussion of where we think the Metro mayors are going to end up. County Commissioners, Director Partridge. Mac has not met this year yet. We meet Friday, actually. Thank you. Uh, Advisory Committee on Aging, Ms. Sanchez Warren. No report. Not yet. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rex, Rack. We also have not met yet. Great, we're moving along. <laughs> E-470, Director Rakowski. E-470 has met. Uh, after long and faithful service from Parker, Josh Martin stepped down. He did a great job. And new people were elected. Mayor Heidi Williams as chair, Vice Chair Commissioner Ted Tedesco, and uh, Tre Treasurer Secretary uh, Steve Douglas from uh, Commerce City. Do you see a trend here? And you should, because our friends from Adams County have taken over. <laughs> all of them are from Adams County. <laughs> all right, fast tracks, Mr. Van Meter. So I'll soak up the next 15 minutes. No, no. Um, there has been no meeting relating to fast tracks at the board level and no real news to report yet this year. Well, I will mention, uh, Speaking of RTD, that the um, the new chair is a former director here, That's right. Mr. Well, Tisdale. Yes, that is indeed the case, but that's not a fast tracks action. Right. I'm always a little I just, I just wanted uncertain to as to whether this board wants to hear the big news from RTD that might be of relevance or interest, or contain my informative updates just to fast tracks I, as. I, Articulated on I the think it, agenda. I think it, at nine, I think it, I think at nine forty-eight. Uh, yes, but I just thought I'd mention that Director Tisdale is now the chair. Indeed. Um, on the next page, there are a number of informational items that I encourage you to take a look at if you haven't already. And is there anything else from members for the good of the cause, uh, Director Graves? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just uh, one footnote on our earlier discussion, and also an ask on a totally different issue for the board. I just want to thank the body for a really civil discourse tonight. It was a passionate discussion. There was no shortage of opinions and, and heart for where we need to take the region. 
And I think that the civil discourse is important, but I also think the manner in which we implement the will of the body is also important. So I will be a willful, willful participant as we go forward to make sure that we are honoring the will of the body. And, uh, and so I just want to thank you guys. Okay, so on a, a much lighter note, many of you have seen the news that Mayor Hancock is convening a Denver Olympic and Paralympic Exploratory Committee. And I just learned this afternoon that I have been appointed as an advisor to a subcommittee of the Exploratory Committee for community engagement. And while I don't know much yet, I've been authorized to request of this body time to brief you on the exploration efforts. And so I'm requesting some time potentially on the February agenda or with the executive committee of the board at your discretion. Thank you. Thank you. Other items? It would be winter, and hopefully it doesn't feel like summer. <laughs> Other items for the good? At 9.50, we are adjourned. <laughs>